Hey folks, and welcome to a Daily Ratings Podcast. It's a show where each week we're going to be sitting down with Vincent Daly to get his thoughts on the latest movies he's been watching, both older films and new releases. And don't worry, there's no spoilers. Vince will give a brief review of the movie, share some thoughts, and of course, then rate the film. The Daily Ratings are always fair, honest, and most importantly, they're consistent. On today's show, Vince will be rating and reviewing... We have Mad Max, directed by George Miller, Mad Max 2 The Road Warrior, directed by George Miller, Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, directed by George Miller and George Ogilvy, Mad Max Fury Road, directed by George Miller, and finally, newly released, now in theaters, Furiosa, a Mad Max saga, directed by, you guessed it, George Miller. So it is a Mad Mad Wax, Mad Max Meek, folks. Stay tuned and enjoy. Mr. Vincent Daly, <laughs> a Mad Max week. Yeah, a tongue-tied over tongue-tied. there. Tongue-tied, a Mad Mad Max week is what I was going for. It's going to say everyone find their leather, put it on. Oh, right, right. Get their sawed-off shotgun. Make sure you have enough guzzoline for the episode. Yeah, it's in the guzzoline. <laughs> How was your Mad Max week? Oh, this was a great week of movies. Uh, really enjoyable. Uh, and, and also, like, just movies that... I feel like aren't getting enough love, even with the hype of Furiosa. I mean, of course, what we're talking about before the podcast, Furiosa has been disappointing with the um, box office. With the box office, so uh, hopefully this will, you know, uh, I'm sure a lot of people haven't seen uh, any of these Mad Max films. Maybe Fury Road. uh, So hopefully this can kind of stoke some interest. Yeah, Fury Road definitely took off in its own unique way. Yeah, almost nine years ago, 2015, Mm -hmm. and I don't know this one. The hype was there, and immediately got shot down Mm. you know what i mean yeah yeah and i think it's i'm finding that because it's so hit or miss now how the box office is going to be it's like Mm -hmm. people are just taking a shot in the dark i don't quite agree with that i think so much relies on media now Mm. and social media sure where something cannot something doesn't have to even be that good Mm -hmm. but if the media is talking about it then all of a sudden it's a it's a international thing absolutely you know what i mean top of mind it's awareness uh and I feel like Mad Max has always been a a tough IP to get that hype around. I mean, certainly, like, you'll get it in, like, nerd spaces, anyone that knows the term post-apocalyptic, you know. But when it comes to, you know, normal hype for the series, I feel like it's a weirdo series. You're not going to bring your girlfriend to Mad Max. (laughs) But (laughs) but that's what made Fury Road, so that was organic. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? It's rated R. It's probably going to do somewhat okay. It's different. It's Return to yeah. Mad Max. But then it got it got pumped into overdrive mm. uh, because it was actually really good and unique and just a crazy film. Yep. yep. Where, I don't know. I understand that media and social media has always been driving films. Mm-hmm. But I think to an extent that we just don't have anymore. Yeah. Because people kind of forgot about the theater post-COVID. Mm-hmm. But also, it's it's not so much what do we think audiences are going to like. It's like... How can we market this and make something culturally talked about? Mm, yeah. Again, yeah. Always, always something you want to do when a movie comes out. Sure. But something almost that is necessary now, like an Oppenheimer mm-hmm. or so, yeah, and, and Barbie. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, it's just it's, – it, it's annoying to me that since COVID we have one big movie a year mm. and then everybody comes out, this is going to be the one that saves films. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know saves I mean? cinema. Right, right. Which is such like a, a, a stupid talking point to begin with. And also, how many like, times can it be saved? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Matt, that's another thing. Matt, <laughs> is, it st- is it continually failing? Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because I think this year, it's I don't know, it's it's annoying. We ha- We had Maverick. And I think mm. that was the first big one post COVID. Mm-hmm. Then Avatar two came out six months after that. Sure. Then we had Barbenheimer. Yep. And now I think people just have it baked into the cake. It's going to be Deadpool three, and that's mm. all we're going to care about. Sure, sure. As the sole Marvel, um, that was honestly my thought: is that are the theaters feeling a little bit of a withdrawal of superhero content? No, I don't uh, think so. Because there's burnout with superhero content. But um, but yeah, uh, I, I'm just curious where this is going to fall. Uh, this also ties into a uh, film that we covered already, The Fall Guy, already hitting streaming, 
which bad is bad news. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm on two minds on it. I think there's in the age of, of digital film, there's really no reason to hold back uh, on getting it to streaming. So uh, I think that's fine is if it's just uploading well, a file to these <laughs> to these websites, you know, to these apps. But at the same time, I feel like there is a mystique to or, or, or magic to leaving the theater in its in its own uh, on its own. Yeah. Uh, and not uh, possibly cannibalizing that market uh, by releasing something too quickly. Yeah, I think it's best if it stays in the theater for a little while. You don't, yeah. I don't want people to think that it's just like, well, just screw it. If no one goes see it, it's going to be on streaming even sooner. Yeah. So I'll just we'll just wait it out. I mean, it was the worst Memorial Day opening since, I have told you before we, we hit play, this was the worst Memorial Day opening since Casper, like the 30 <laughs> years or something like that. I and, love Casper, And, and the thing is, I, we'll, get in, we'll get into Furiosa. <laughs> I'm not, and, and I'm not gonna. It's not like it's the best movie ever. Yeah. But it deserves to make money. It's, oh, it, for it, sure. It's good enough where it deserves asses and seats yeah. to see in a loud, big theater. Absolutely. And it's that's a, not it's gonna a theater happen. experience. I feel like uh, supporting George Miller as a creative visionary. Right. Uh, it hits on a lot of notes, uh, but maybe all those notes are. Uh, not the average moviegoer. You know, yeah. Maybe that's in our world of kind of cinephiles and, and terminally online no. person, you know, yeah, opinions. If it was two, <laughs> but if it was 2019, that wouldn't be the case. Yeah. Everything has changed and just like, I mean, theaters are freaking out and, I mean, I mean, studio heads, of course, studio mm. execs are freaking out as they should be. Mm. Uh, I don't know. The streaming thing is really, I'm starting to get more and more sour mm, really? on it. And yeah, there's going to have to be I don't know. They're gonna have the studios are gonna have to figure out something. It doesn't help that movies in general are not that great. Mm, but sure. we've had some we've had some winners this year. Yeah, I, and if anything, we're kind of uh, spitting in the wind uh, no, on all this talk of uh, you know twenty twenty four being on the decline for for movies and, and the theater. Uh, in that, I really do strongly believe there's been some great movies. There has this been. Year. Yeah, yeah, we've been coming out swinging. Some so. have been so small though yeah. that they're never going to do well for box office. Sure, or we're but, never shooting for those heights. Right, right. Uh, to begin with, so it is that double edged sword a little bit. Yeah. But anyway, uh, we took a the trip down memory lane. I watched all of these except for Beyond Thunderdome. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> So I can, can join in with either, whether it's love or hate. I can be there. Yep, yep. Uh, and it's a series episode here, folks, for Mad Max, but uh, also really one of our director uh, episodes as well with co- creative control never leaving George Miller's hands. That's I mean, for sure. This is his baby Yeah. Uh, in a big way. We have Mad Max 1, 2, and Fury Road all previously rated on the site. Uh, and if you have a keen eye on our website, there isn't really going to be uh, adjustment there. Uh, but I hope uh, to give kind of an interesting perspective to these films because mm-hmm. I really enjoy this entire series. Uh, I do want to lead with an alternative watch list uh, for uh, oh, yeah. anyone right at the beginning. You're kind of maybe checking this out to see uh, how to approach this series if you haven't before. Uh, Fury Road is first, especially as really the best hook for the new viewer, for a new viewer. Uh, I would say Furiosa is really only logical next, being more of a prequel and filling gaps I didn't expect. Uh, at that point, I would say, you know, recommending circling back to Mad Max 1 and 2. Uh, both of you find the world compelling, but especially if you enjoy Miller's directing style. And finally, most of all, skip Mad Max 3 entirely. <laughs> <laughs> like, beyond, beyond Thunderdome? Yeah, yeah. Like you have masterfully done. I wish I could be in your shoes, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's okay. I I really dis, I don't dis, I disagree. Okay, with that watch list oh, off the bat, almost entirely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, well, what would you give? What would you? I would watch Mad go? Max one, then two, then Furiosa, then Fury Road. Oh, Furiosa per, uh, first before Fury Road. Yeah. Well, okay. first of all, I think I like the idea of watching the first one and second one mm. because. Where was how did we start the, mm-hmm. this? And Mad Max One might be important because it's the earliest back we can go sure. as far as this this fake world that we're in. Sure, you know sure. what I mean, post apocalyptic world. We can kind of see it going to shit in real time. Mm. Then we have Mad Max Two, mm-hmm. and then go into Furiosa because it's at the na- well one. It's the prequel. prequel it is yeah. Fury Road, and not only that, Fury Road is better. So yeah, and then you end on a high note. Well, it, end on the high note. That's where I'm like, if someone truly has not seen any anything Mad Max, yeah. As far as a watch order, I want to lead with the high note in the sense that, like, Fury Road, that's that's the hook to set. Okay. I guess I'm going, if you already know that you're going to sink your teeth into the mm. Mad Max world, watch, watch it mine. Chronologically. If you're not sure if you want to sink your teeth into Mad Max world, yeah. do the Vintage. <laughs> do the Vintage. 
<laughs> or, uh, hey, two I, shoes I, or Vim. What do we want? I mean, <laughs> you, you got two sides. <laughs> who, 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 who are you staying with after the divorce? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, all right. Let's any more opening notes? No, 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 that's good. Okay. So, it's a very old franchise. Let's go back to 1979. Mm, yep. It's crazy. Mel Gibson, it's I think Mel Gibson is still in his 60s. <laughs> yeah. Which is crazy. Yeah, yeah. And he's in this film, you know, that was 45 years ago. Yeah. Anyway, it is Mad Max. This is George Miller. It's um it just launches us off into this Mad Max world. Let's get into it, break it down, we'll take it back and forth. Sure, sure. So, uh, much like we covered way back with John Carpenter's Escape from New York, the stylings of the post-apocalyptic subgenre had not settled yet. Uh, This film, being two years earlier than that, shows the same rough edges. It kind of resembles, resembles what we know of the film series and the genre, but... Only slightly off. Um, Also, it would pain me if I did not shout out the real granddaddy of post-apocalyptic sci-fi, 1975's A Boy and His Dog. Folks, that is a full recommendation if you like Mad Max and have not seen it. Uh, Boy uh, Boy and His Dog is a big step for the style we all love today and uh, has uh, even surprising echoes. Wait a second. Even in Mad Max. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait, wait. We have friends that really like that. I thought you... Poo pooed that film no, a little bit. No, no, I like that movie. Real? Oh, okay, yeah, all right. Yeah. Okay. Poo poo. <laughs> it's a small. I mean, it's interesting. It's it's kind of all right. I mean, well, I I think it's important that it's uh, a good couple years earlier, and even you have Road Warrior borrowing the dog motif as far as like kind of wasteland adventures, right? As well. Right. Right. So. Uh, Mad Max sets us in Australia, but not as the Aussies know it. Uh, We are introduced to a dystopian future where motor madness rules the day. Uh, I would say it's almost like an American graffiti on meth, which uh, the more I sit on that description, the more I really love it. Uh, (laughs) uh, As the first big lead role for Mel Gibson, Max begins his story as a high-speed interceptor cop uh, designed to cut down the crazed youth on the road as society holds on by a thread more biker gangs and speed demons take to the road to revel in the chaos that is until they piss off the wrong cop and drive him over the edge i i think my biggest appreciation on this rewatch is all around george miller's directing the priorities of this are clear Film fast cars driving ludicrously dangerous. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, from the scrambled up, sped up shots to the driver's seat to lightning quick edits to even some surprising quality stunt work with the cars. And I really do think the car wrecks look excellent in this first one uh, in a way that two and three don't. The style might not be set in stone yet as far as that apocalyptia. But the core of the film shows us the blue, the blueprint of what Miller can achieve in creating action on screen. Uh, it's exactly why, at least on the on the Vin side of the <laughs> of the watch list, why I would recommend watching after Fury Road because you'll clearly see the series is equally about these hectic racing scenes just as much as its wasteland sci-fi vision it'll become. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, a priority that is completely lost in the third movie, Beyond Thunderdome, <laughs> which I'll be jabbing at frequently. I would say, on that note, how that world is portrayed is probably the weakest part of the film, and I've always felt this being pretty substantial, especially for a first watch of the movie. Yeah. Uh, prior to Fury Road, if I was to recommend Mad Max, I'd just say watch the second one, and that's kind of it. Uh, but. Somewhere between Max's romance with his wife, the cop procedural story structure, and all the madness going largely unexplained, I would call this first film muddy as far as what we're getting to know about the world of Mad Max. I don't know. Mm-hmm. What, are, what yeah. is your thought? Muddy is good. There's, it's just it, – it's not unbelievable. It's not polished. Mm. Uh, it is not a large movie at all. It feels like a low-budget – it feels exactly what it is. It feels like a low-budget 70s film. That was made in Australia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know what I mean? I mean, a little punk rock, but definitely amateur. Uh, yes, <laughs> I think, and I'm. I don't love this movie. I think mm. it maybe only some very unique fans of this franchise would say, "Oh, I love it," or it's the mm, best. Sure. Um, it's it's hard to come away. I, I don't really feel the need that I need to watch this ever again. Mm. But I'm glad that I did because I think it does set up the arc of Max. Mm-hmm. I like going. The, the reason why I kind of like starting here as well is because. 
you real really do see it just as the flip switched in the world, mm, just yep. as things really start start to get crazy. There is some sort of semblance of law, yep. and structure and societal structures, mm-hmm. and seeing that crumble away almost throughout the film or where we're you know we're that early process. I think mm-hmm. it's important, and also getting that arc of Max that kind of sets up the rest of the series. I like it for that reason. I'm happy I watched it, mm. um, but it is super unpolished. I think Muddy is totally fine. Yeah, and just. The execution could only be achieved so high with just limitations on everything. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and it's just like it's also in the, the background themes. I mean by this point in the story, there is supposed to be this oil crisis, the uh, ecosystem breaking down. But it's all not communicated clearly enough. Um, and this is, again, me seeing this as what it is. It's a dystopian sci-fi. You know, These, these yeah. concepts need to be a little bit more in the foreground uh, for it. And for that reason, we kind of feel like that – you could be watching most of this movie, and it just feel like a small town Australian gang movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's where and, this American and, graffiti on meth kind of concept <laughs> came in, because it's just like, oh, you know, this might have been just the car culture of Australia. At right, some point. right. And there's, there's just very few things pointing towards, you know, the way the cop station looks like, <laughs> yeah, and just yep. things that are kind of crumbling on the edges. Yep, yep. You can tell it's just like, okay, this is some type of different world, actually. Absolutely, absolutely. And and you know, who knows? Maybe that will be the mark of brilliance to this first film more and more as we dip into mm-hmm. like. We're you know neck deep in style, you oh, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, of of Miller's uh, Miller's world, but uh, or the vision for the wasteland. I would say a lot of it is just driven home by shock value of characters doing the heavy lifting. I think for the actual structure of the film, in a lot of ways, this story feels closer to a hyper violent revenge flick of the seventies. Um, what comes to mind is nineteen seventy four's Death Wish with Charlie Bronson, and mm. probably be the template that would have been some level of inspiration for Miller originally. Uh, but especially how it's structured, of we get to know Max's day to day his romance with his wife, uh, and all of that being put under kind of a vice grip pressure of these crazy biker gangs, uh, that that's where I was kind of compared to more than, uh, as we see in the next films, him kind of become a cowboy in the wasteland or like a gun for hire in the wasteland. Mm -hmm, So mm -hmm. um, I'll make my last plea with watching Fury Road (laughs) first. (laughs) I didn't know you were going to shoot it down. So. <laughs> uh, but it, it's also my favorite piece of trivia for the film. Um, Hugh Keyes Burns plays uh, the uh, jokerish gang leader that torments Max and his family. Uh, if only he wasn't undercut by a stupid-ass name like Toe Cutter. I mean, <laughs> not, not a great name for a villain. <laughs> we do get a great yelp out of him when the granny points the gun at him, though. I really do love that scene. He just, he just freaks out. He gets a huge redemption, the actor, uh, however, when George Miller brought him back as the lead bad guy in Fury Road, the vile and almighty Morton Joe. Sadly, Hugh passed away in 2022 and is replaced in Furiosa for the role. Uh, but in many, in the many, many stories uh, that we've even touched on on the podcast of director-actor duos, I've always loved this one for a little bit of a heart-touching element, but also because he comes back as a ten times, hundred times crazier villain. Yeah, that, it's you insane. Know? It's like, whoa. Uh, so uh, just uh, a little piece of enjoyment and uh, not to cut toe cutter down too much but uh, i guess he's an all right villain he's, he's got some joker <laughs> he is, no energy. he's a good yeah he definitely does yeah yeah but uh with that said uh it's simple uh, i can't really go into much more because it really is a straightforward story uh with that said we're gonna go ahead and give mad max 1979 a 68 a 68 percent which i think it's a very yeah it's a very fair score and i think that says a lot about the film i yeah. think where it's it lacks or struggles in areas mm-hmm. there's enough there that it feels important. It feels like it should be watched. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And not to toot our own horn here on the podcast, but by the time these three movies were rated, one, yeah. two, and Fury Road, I-, I feel like both of us were on the same page of watching in modern day. Uh, and oh, I feel like the ab- 68 is really balanced for Mad Max because if you do watch it out of nowhere, it's like, what the hell is this? <laughs> you know, but it's, it's, it's still got that racing DNA. I will toot our own horn or I'll toot your horn. <laughs> I mean, we started, we were, years and years, we were rating movies, you were rating movies <laughs> right, long right. before the podcast, yeah. but you still had a criteria in your head. You still had this, this, these notions or these feelings towards mm, films. Yep. 
And even though we're not fleshed out 136 episodes on the podcast, even mm. back then there was something there where the 68 is exactly still today. Yeah. Holds up as a 68. Absolutely. Which I love. Even without any kind of respect of anyone else seeing that rating. Right. You know? <laughs> like that was just for me and you, basically. Right. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, but yeah, uh, definitely a good movie. Again, I, I feel like it's a, it's a, it's a, a tough hook, especially without the aesthetics of the world really being set in stone just yet. Uh, set, the aesthetics of the wasteland. You know? I think I, I, I really – it's almost not recommended watching mm. except for the fact that we know we have this rebirth mm. in 2015. Sure. You know what I mean? It really adds an importance to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. But regardless, 68 for the very first Mad Max um, and for, again, budget, where it was shot, actors involved – it, it, it's amazing that it picked up into this cult following that it did. Yeah, like very yeah. impressive. Yep. So that was seventy nine, and right away, two years later, we're nineteen eighty one. Mel Gibson is back. This is Mad Max Two: The Road Warrior. Again, all these directed by George Miller. Set this one up. Where are we at? And uh, like I said, we'll take it back and forth. Uh, well, right off the bat, we start much stronger. The opening narration gives us some straight answers around what kind of caused the apocalypse in this world. And even a little context to the last film, which I feel was much needed. And then, bam, the film hits you with the true vision of what the wasteland should be. Right on pace with what we know for the franchise. Black leather, tuned up junker cars, and crazed looks on every character's face. Yeah. Uh, I feel like in a lot of ways, this movie represents the rare style of sequel. Uh, Yes, the world of Mad Max is bigger and badder than ever, but more than anything, you can feel that in the wake of Star Wars, this is attempting to punch above its weight in transforming into a big sci-fi fantasy adventure with a heroic soundtrack, a anti-hero lead star, uh, and again... Not really like a revenge flick from the seventies. The first one is this is what this is the movie that you feel that Mad Max and Miller are trying to compete with blockbusters in in his mm-hmm, own trilogy. Mm-hmm. So I feel like for a lot of people that just is going to work so much better for this. In addition to the aesthetics of the wasteland and and everything going on with the yeah, story, that for the, exactly like you said, it opens up kind of just gives a disposition a little bit mm-hmm. of where we were, where we are now, and then boom, movie goes. You don't have to deal with so much of what the first one was hindered by. Yeah, absolutely. And, and now, and I will say, I mean, something that you know, credit to that first one. The racing sequences in that first one have a certain viciousness, have a certain edge, a like punk rock appeal uh, that these these later films don't have. But it's because these more the, the larger production elements yeah, are yeah, kind of yeah. stepping into play. Uh, the, those rough edges are definitely rounded for a reason, and I feel for the sake of this you know survival of the series. Uh, Mad Max 2's story structure feels closer to, like I said, a kind of a man-with-no-name western with Mel Gibson once again playing Max, our wandering hero dispensing cold justice in the wasteland. Uh, Life in that wasteland has gotten pretty damn rough, though, especially for Max, who has built a hardcore reputation alongside his V8 interceptor as the Road Warrior. Uh, On his journey, he comes across friends and foes alike with madness ruling a lawless land. When he finds an outpost of survivors getting harassed by marauders, however, his sense of justice rises to defend them or at least get a tank of fuel for his troubles. Uh, One problem, these crazed bikers have evolved into batshit crazy psychopaths. (laughs) Uh, Whatever's in the water is still in the water. (laughs) Uh, And uh, they are led by a senseless hulk of a man named Lord Humongous, uh, one of many in Mad Max's rogues gallery that will leave him with a scar. I would say Mad Max as a character solidifies in his, uh, once again, uh, heroic wandering justice role, which once again feels more Hollywood than his depiction in the last film as a man driven to the edge of sanity. Uh, it's it's not only until we get to Fury Road that we see some sort of psychological spin uh, introduced to the character again, mm-hmm. uh, that he's actually haunted uh, by his experience. Uh, Here, I don't think it's a problem, though. This helps us come to grips with all the madness thrown on screen. You don't think that's present? Um, No, I really don't. I think it is in the fact of it's coming straight off of one. Mm -hmm. And again, that just the script in the beginning that lays Mm -hmm. down what happened to Max that put him in the state that he's in now. Mm -hmm. It's assumed that he's dealing 
I don't know. I, I feel like it's laid out a little bit. Okay. I don't think it's ever present, maybe as much. Mm-hmm. But there is something there. I mean, we have to know why he is the way he is. Sure, you know sure. What I mean? And I feel like that's always some type of through line. He definitely does have like the empathy to say, you know, help the people. Uh, his connection with the kid, uh, with the boomerang kid. I forget what. what but yeah, I know he doesn't have a real name, but he has a different name than boomerang <laughs> kid. <laughs> but as far as his why he's even in the state that he is, mm-hmm. what happened to him mm-hmm. or taken from him? You know what I mean. Sure. Like how do how do we get Mad Max? How does he get mad? Yeah, true, true. And I feel like that's just always a thread. Yeah, and he, he does. I guess to your point, that there are a few conversations where, like, uh, with the leader of the outpost, he's like, "What do you have? Your family to- taken from you? You know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, this this we all have a story like that. You right. know, what I mean, there there is a, an element of that there. But I get what you're saying, where maybe it's not ever present. Yeah, I I think it's just that um, I wanted the I don't know uh, Max to be a little bit more broken as we see him being. Actually, like a like uh, okay. struggling to function in, in Fury Road, I, right, right, you know? right. Uh, as whether it's be flashbacks <laughs> or psychological scars sure, okay. or something like that. But you know, I, I, this is a more traditional depiction of a reluctant hero, uh, and um, like I said, it helps us kind of come to grips with all that's new to audiences and all that's new to when you're watching this for the first time. Uh, a significant jump in in, in madness. Uh, and if anything, the typical setup of innocence being taken advantage of helps us define what Max is willing to put his neck on the line for, especially after a significant time jump in the story. We would really, you know, it's it's hard to position yeah. where he's going to be with this, uh, what, what has changed in the character. I also want to give a quick shout out to Bruce Spence, uh, playing one of my favorite supporting characters in the series, simply called the Gyro Captain. <laughs> uh, he's just a top tier weirdo actor. Uh, my comparison here is he, he looks like Stephen Merchant if he was acting in the 80s. Oh, that's not bad. <laughs> yeah. Do you know As what a, else he was in? What are we? He's in a few things. Um, he plays a role in the 90s movie Dark City, which I've mentioned. <laughs> A few times as a hidden gem, and <laughs> we'll continue to die on that hill. <laughs> uh, and I'll bring up whenever I can, but he's really not in that much. Okay. Uh, he is also in uh, Mad Max 3, uh, but he, for some mind boggling reason, uh, basically same, plays the same uh, character, mm-hmm. still is a pilot. Not the same character, though. Miller has gone on record. That oh. It's just like, this is not the that's same character. That's just weird. Okay, yeah, that's just, super weird. Yeah, uh, I'm really not sure what went on there because it's intentionally confusing, especially when Max has like a uh, like a confrontation with him in 3. Right. And it's like, oh, wait, don't they know each other? Like, what's going on here? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, just uh, some poor miscasting. But if you're craving more Bruce Spence, uh, check out Dark City. <laughs> check out the extended edition of uh, The Lord of the Rings Return of the King as well because oh, apparently he's in it. Oh, really? He also plays Chum in Finding Nemo, the voice, <laughs> one of the sharks. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right, a goofy looking guy. Yeah, a very tall, Steve, lanky. Steve Merchant is good. Long, long head. Yep, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I feel like uh, that's a, just a total transplant. Um, prior to George Miller returning to his world in 2015, Road Warrior was really the pinnacle of what to watch and what to expect from post-apocalyptic sci-fi, and that's definitely before uh, you know any degree of. Not copycats, but the many projects inspired by the Mad Max world. Mm -hmm. Uh, Of course, very hot recently is Fallout, which would be honestly nothing without Road Warrior. Um, Watching these films back to back, I personally think the racing scenes felt like a slight step backwards, utilizing more sped up footage in the chase sequence, but literally everything else I feel is a significant step up. The car designs blend hot rod culture with this dystopian lethality, you know, something that wasn't really done outside of animation with projects like heavy metal. Uh, and certainly going uh, way farther than something like Death Race that we saw in the, earlier in the 70s. Mm. Uh, the action is violent and shocking. The best moment going to a very unexpected boomerang kill. It gets me every <laughs> time. It's just like, wait, he really died there? <laughs> like, what's going on there? Uh, and boy, do you feel the budget in way, way more pyrotechnics all over this film. Uh, I just wish more of that went into the type of racing scenes we saw in the first film and less of the sped-up footage, Um, especially when they're driving off, like, asphalt or or the road. Almost everything is just kind of, like, sloppily sped up. And 
I liked it. It's kind of Miller's trademark I mean, that, that sped it, up footage. He but... does it in Fury Road. Yeah. One reason one reason that's good to watch Fury Road first because it was it made me feel good. I was like, well, yeah. at least he did that for a reason. Yeah. A lot of people talked about that. Sure. Very quick sped up scenes. Like, why did it speed this up? Why they have to, mm. why can't they just have Tom Hardy running away from these white guys? Yeah, yep. Um but <laughs> it all it guys. all makes sense now. And something about it really works. Yeah. Watching this again, uh, or for the first time actually, but watching it and with the sped up again, mm. uh, it felt good. It felt like I was home a little bit. Yeah. So yeah. I, so I I liked it personally. Okay, interesting, interesting. Because this whole thing is is, is style, and mm. it's it's just it's it's his DNA. And it, yeah, it's about making you. It's every aspect of this film or his what he's trying to do with this franchise is unease. Mm. He wants it to be chaotic. He wants it to be uneasy, mm-hmm. and that's just what he does constantly. Yeah, it is nonstop. Yeah, absolutely. I guess where I. I enjoy the first one is just like how fast it seems like they're going especially on the shots that there's some sort of dolly or crane yeah. placing the camera real low to the ground and yeah the interceptors sweeping in i just feel like in this one and definitely the third one which basically has no racing in it it's something something was was kind of lost uh hmm, okay. in, in just just how fast it really felt uh but to the point that we've been making, that's what makes Fury Road so great. Uh, it's, it's just a return tenfold yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, into everything that's so great about it. I don't know. What are your thoughts on some of the, I mean, I don't know, Lord Humongous? I, or, <laughs> I, I thought it goes I didn't crazy. I this was the first time you watched this. <clears throat> yeah, I never saw the, the original really? series at all. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was just, like, happy with Fury Road. Okay. And I knew I just didn't think I was going to get it. But I knew just... Old movies in Australia, I just felt I could yeah I could, impossibly I, high. I could smell the low budgetness on it. Sure, sure. Regardless, this to me, it, this is a smaller story mm-hmm. than one, but a bigger film, mm. a bigger great movie. way of describing it. You know what I mean? Because I think about the story, and it's just like this is the most basic thing on paper. Mm. Like honestly, I mean, just even. St- it's, it's a cowboy story. It's it's a fistful of dollars. It's basically. extremely basic. Yeah, extremely basic. And we don't even have to travel to too many places. <laughs> right. There's, I mean, that's what I'm saying. The bi- the first one had a bigger story, but this just definitely feels big. Like you said, the pyrotechnics are up. The amount of vehicles are up. Mm-hmm. I mean, everything is just up in it, mm-hmm. except for story complexity, basically. Mm-hmm. And I was okay with it. Sure. And I thought everything looked better, which, as you expect with the second sure, one. Sure, sure. But do you think specifically, I mean, to, to uh, tie back to what we were just saying, you know, watching in the modern day, yeah. do you think this holds up? to some degree, to the new vision of the Wasteland with Fury Road where, you know, the design is through the roof. Do you still think it has enough bite uh, or enough uh, apocalyptic No, I mean, there's just it? such different properties in my head. <laughs> they really are. Yeah, it's a what transformation. I, I, I like stepping it back in time, 40 years, or mm-hmm. more than for 45 years, and watching this, mm-hmm. and then knowing that 2015 exists with Fury Road. Mm. It is a new birth of technology, of yep. sound, of the cinematography, you know what I mean? Just everything behind it. I can see how he got there. Mm-hmm. Like I can see where Fury Road exists or, or sure. how it exists from this franchise. Mm-hmm. But they are so, they're so different. I mean, yeah, yeah, it really is. <laughs> there's some love compare. notes for sure. There's some Easter eggs. Even yeah. with Furiosa, there's some Easter eggs to Road Warrior. Oh yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely. But very minute, very different. Yeah. Again, it's it's just the size, the scope and size of these films. To my mind, it's just so separated. Mm. You have old era, new era. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's where I was kind of challenged with this, as far as. You know, of course, we preach watching a film in modern day and not judging experience for what it was. But you know, these these two films, definitely, definitely Thunderdome as well, uh, show their age uh, as far as oh, yeah. d- set design and costumes and and everything. I mean, quite literally everything in every way. Uh, in every way. I would say uh, I want to make significant note, as I did already for this review. You know, stylistically, not only do we owe a lot to this film, and I mean a lot. You know, you can just look at the wiki for what it inspired, Road Warrior specifically. Uh, but I think it does hold up in a way that I appreciate what's being done with like costumes and 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 the realism that would come from a fairly fresh apocalypse Mm -hmm. yeah Uh, you know i I I found the little moments of world building in the way sports equipment is used for body armor or the way ammo has been increasingly rare so bows have come back as the primary weapon you know these touches might feel minor by today's production standards and certainly the production standards of 
the new era, we'll call it, with uh, George Miller. But I think it does sell how scrappy the Wasteland would actually be. And for that reason, I, I do think Road Warrior is still, it earns a spot in the mythos of Mad Max. With that said, we're going to go ahead and give Mad Max to the Road Warrior a 73. 73. I mean, this is a very good score. Yeah. You know, 73 for us is, that's a pretty damn good movie. Absolutely. Um, and I like it because it was a fun watch still, mm-hmm. you know, 45 years later. It's, it was a very good watch. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious where, which villain is your favorite? I mean, we're, we're missing Tina Turner in, in Thunderdome for your experience, but I'm curious by the end, which, which mad, crazy biker psycho is going to come out <laughs> on top? <laughs> that's another thing that I parcel them so, di- well, one, I, I'm not as drawn to the bad guys. I just okay. know it's just that they're chaotic figures. They're all the Joker in <laughs> right. some sort of way. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but and to me, they're so different. Again, in Mad Max, in the very first one, we were just dealing with an insane b- biker. biker gang. Yeah, yeah. And the craziness doesn't come from leather and, and like mentally crazy people. It mm. comes, there's a, like, I didn't realize because it's set in 79 in Australia and mm. it's just back then, the eccentricness mm. of our bad guys is mm-hmm. coming from just like, very gay characters. Yeah, right, right. I didn't realize, you know what I mean? A lot of BDSM vibes, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was like very present in one. Yeah, And yeah. here, and like you said, this is where the really the leather kicks off, uh, yep. and now we're getting people that are just like insane. Absolutely. Which I kind of mm-hmm. like because maybe in an apocalyptic era, it really is only the insane people who can be so evil and <laughs> sure. so insane to survive. A survival instinct, absolutely. And I do yeah. kind of like that. Yeah. Um, and that's what's missing from one. It's just like, let's explore that just a tiny bit more. I mean, I like the priority on the racing sequences, but... But we're on the fr- uh, we just teetered over into apocalyptic era. Sure. Again, there, sure. we still have laws. We still have a police force. Yeah, there's like a however, diner, you know? <laughs> right. However, however, the police station is an absolute mess. Yeah, like, it's, it's just... Like- so we're I love the that friend. the captain is like, I don't know, there's that one scene where he's like showering and he just has like a huge black ascot on. Right. Like, it's just like, what is this? What is this? Uh, okay, so <laughs> 73 for Mad Max 2, a, a very good score and it's still a great watch for today. Yes. No doubt, no yep. doubt. I think it earns its spot uh, and definitely earns its spot. I mean, seriously, you know, go back to uh, the what this inspired uh, and again, just to tune into what's been hot lately, Fallout. Um, you have a, a very, very good watch to see what was the, the predecessor, what was the stepping stone for a lot of the stylings uh, that we see in the genre. I had no idea. Excellent. Yeah. Very cool. All right, so now we're jumping to 1985. This is the only one that's rated PG-13. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. It's Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. <laughs> I avoided it. I don't know either, it, Tom. It, <laughs> <laughs> Vin, you've been dropping hints. I'm going to say that you didn't enjoy this movie too much. <laughs> and I never have. But please break it down. Uh, tell us at least what it's about and then get on to uh, whatever you got to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, if I had a gun to my head, Tom, uh, <laughs> that's how you know we're starting this uh-huh. <laughs> at a certain level. Uh, I, I think I could probably make a case for this film to be enjoyable in a Star Wars prequels kind of way. Kind huh. of fun seeing more design. It's fun seeing more the world, wacky mm-hmm. characters, things like that. Uh, but I still don't think it's a very good movie at all. <laughs> um, if you enjoy a sci-fi entry that broadens the scope of the world, uh, this might be a watch. Uh, but certainly that seems to be the approach of uh, the new film, Furiosa, giving us little dips all over the Mad Max world. George Miller once again shows he wants to play in the big blockbuster sandbox of the 80s, though, by further pulling on growing trends around him. This is now 85, right? 85, yeah. Uh, I mean, this is now uh, post-Lucas doing Star Wars. This is now Spielberg uh, by way of Indiana Jones and working Mm -hmm. with Lucas. I feel like Miller... Uh, feels a pressure in the production of this, tying into that PG-13 rating, to make it mm. more, you know, round the edges of Mad Max, round the edges of the wasteland, and that's really... Make it the, safer. Exactly. Yeah. Make it more palatable for a wider audience. Uh, I don't know. Who knows? Maybe that's what Furiosa needed. I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't think that. But <laughs> <laughs> that that's, that's the objective here and, and really the root of this film's problems. Um, otherwise, it is a steer clear from me. This was the only <laughs> film not rated on the website. And it's because I've always deeply hated this movie. Um, <laughs> uh, I've always felt this movie was made in the 90s. My only internal logic is that it feels like Waterworld with Kevin Costner. Huh. Um, you know, like the set designs. Like, it just feels like cheap and, you know, possibly a tie-in to a theme park somewhere. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> 
Mad Max uh, world. That would be interesting. Yeah, Mad Max world. <laughs> give it, you know, WB, give him time. <laughs> George Miller's going to die eventually. He'll do it. <laughs> uh, but uh, the world building that is gained through this entry in Max's story is not worth shedding the most important piece of the series DNA, the car action, the motor mayhem. Mm -hmm. Um, This has next to no racing in it, uh, besides a very, very brief sequence towards the end. And losing that uh, is substantial. It really loses something significant to why we're watching these movies yeah, at not, all. Not to mention, I was the main through line of this is the gasoline. Yeah, yeah, the exactly. The search for gasoline. I mean, that is everything. Yeah. I mean, even more than food over water. Uh, right, right. It's all Ab- about the gas. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Beyond Thunderdome has our usual setup, being uh, a yet another tale in the wasteland with Mad Max, uh, but splits its time 50-50 with two different dystopian societies. Half the time we send we spend in Barter Town, the biggest mark of civilization we've seen in the series so far, home to the infamous Thunderdome, and is led by the despot ruler Auntie Entity, played by the equally infamous acting career of Tina Turner. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and the other half of the time, we spend with a colony made up exclusively of children. A plane crashing into a desert oasis has stranded them without any adults, but equally without any threats. Uh, the result is a story that is 100% not great. Uh, <laughs> well, the first half kind of explores some interesting concepts like new laws in the wasteland and power dynamics ruling over it. It ultimately gets pushed aside to make room for this... Peter Pan, Lost Boys plot line that genuinely feels like a waste of time. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. I was watching this and it was pulling teeth the entire time. Like, <laughs> I did not enjoy this even slightly. We should say these first three are sub two hours, too. Exactly. This is an hour and 47. <laughs> right, right. Uh, I would say in an attempt to praise the movie a tiny bit, like I said already, with, with you know, kind of seeing it as a, you know, in a, in a Star Wars prequel, it's about the design type of way. Um, This does have some value in being the furthest we get in the Mad Max timeline, even with the new era. Uh, Thunderdome is the last of the the, the chronology. Oh, okay, all right. Most language is lost, uh, creating followers for any kind of sharp mind willing to take power. Uh, Something that will actually be expanded more in Furiosa. Uh, Like I said a moment ago, civilization and law are taking their first steps at being reestablished. Kangaroo Court taking a whole different meaning for these Aussies. <laughs> uh, and what's yeah, sorry, that's a, that's a no, I liked check. it. Actually. Okay, right. <laughs> two shoes. <laughs> excellent, excellent. <laughs> uh, and once again, like I opened with, I think the fun designs of this film can still be enjoyable in expanding the world building of the series. The fact that Barter Town is like run on the methane of pigs is a clever piece of sci-fi writing, mm. and. There's sprinkles of that all over the film, so there you go. <laughs> but if I'm being honest, folks, uh, uh, it is not hard for me to pinpoint why I don't like this movie at all. Kind of rapid fire, it's Tina Turner, both largely a miscast and just like a super weak villain. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, it's a character called Master Blaster, which is really the only aspect that I wish you did watch it just so we could like trauma, like bond over the trauma of this character on screen. <laughs> Um, this is a character that a dwarf that is master uh, and the brains of literally piloting like a hulking man called Blaster. Uh, <laughs> okay, that's very Mad Max. Sure, sure. I feel like it, it's a uh, it's a little bit of a mix of uh, crass and tasteless design and just genuinely annoying on screen mm. as a character. Uh, just doesn't work for me at all. Uh, It's definitely these PG-13 kids, which forces the writing to put Max in this horrible adopted father role that clashes with every ounce of the brutality the series is known for. Uh, And and maybe most of all, it is the suspicious lack of the keystone to the whole film franchise, the motor mayhem and ludicrous psychopaths. Um, It's just between these four points... The film is barely worth anything to me. <laughs> I think it's barely worth anything to fans. And the biggest shock was kind of going back to and you know looking at the critical reception of these, especially since you know yeah. most of these were rated already. It was kind of easy work for me this week. The fact that this one is rated just as high as Road Warrior. And it's it just is. Like, yeah, it's like what? People, what are people like, thinking? I didn't know that Tina Turner was bad. 
Mm, yes. And she is. She's like, just not. She's not an actress. Right, right, yeah, right. She's, she's, you know, big wheels keep on turning, not on film. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's just rough. Yeah, uh, it's I mean, really, really rough. I, I think the overall, like you keep on saying, rounded rounding out the rough edges kind of mm-hmm. and making it safe in, in the PG-13 setting. It's setting itself up. It's shooting itself in the foot for actually what makes the franchise great, mm. which is absolute crazy mayhem. It's almost the point to watch these films is you're watching the movie and just being like, well, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah like, exactly. What does that person it's look like? Value. How is this? How are they keeping this person alive? <laughs> what vehicles are we doing? What tra- yeah. trace scenes? Whatever. That's what it's all about. So yes. a tame version of that. It's, it's it's setting itself up to hurt itself. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. There is one more. I lied. There's there's a fifth reason. Oh, okay, why go I really ahead. don't like this. Go ahead. <laughs> and wow, wow, wow! It is it is it some real bad music in this horrifically eighties and mm. some of the most inappropriate saxophone I think ever put into a film. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the reason why this kills the experience for me is because what we've been hitting on so far it totally betrays the tone of the series, providing more goofy, bombastic moments that. Uh, don't come anywhere close to feeling menacing or terrifying. In addition to Tina Turner's contributions, the score was largely done by Maurice Jarre, uh, mind-blowingly responsible for the Lawrence of Arabia soundtrack, Mm. uh, and then this pile (laughs) of shit, so I'm just going to leave Maurice alone. Um, it might be self-explanatory, but the problems all start and end with this being PG-13. Uh, the only entry to dip below rated R. Uh, if you need a single example, a single scene, it probably has to be when Master is being tortured. Tom, this is a scene that we see Master losing power over Barter Town and being lowered down into a pit of hungry pigs. <laughs> Uh, only as the horrific reality sets in that he is too small to fight them off. Like, right. really like a terrifying <laughs> scene. Like, uh, like horrific, scarring even. Uh, this is then bookended with cutesy kid fun time and our new Papa Mad Max not knowing how to raise them. <laughs> it's just, it is a mess. Uh This film is in constant conflict with itself, smashing the twisted and terrifying vision of the wasteland with cute, heartwarming adventure beats, and through this, it makes an experience made for no one. Uh, We're going to go ahead and give Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome a 25. Ooh, a 25. Bad, bad, bad. I told you, I do not like this movie. Wow, okay. I think this movie misses every target. A 25%. A 25. Very bad. Very bad. Very bad. And, and like you said, it doesn't sound like you, we really need it for any story development for the, for the yeah. movies before, for the movies that come after it. Yeah, until they maybe – or Miller maybe explores – post this in the timeline. Mm-hmm, right. Um, where, you know, I don't know, Max would need to because find a new car or something like that. You know, a permanent interceptor or something. I don't know. Um, we do see Barter Town again. Yes. Like that comes up in Furiosa. Yep. Absolutely. But unnecessary still? Like, it's uh, fine? Unnecessary. Like, I felt like I got it. I didn't need exactly. Any. I mean, it's called Barter Town. It's about as deep as Gas Town or Bullet Farm. Right, so, right, right. you know, these are locales <laughs> that kind of are self explanatory. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But yeah, not to be a downer on the film, certainly not to be a downer in a week that is designed to really praise uh, George Miller's directing, but this one, again, I think I think the story is told in this coming out specifically in 85 and the pressure of Hollywood and these ma- never-before yeah, yeah. blockbusters, these, me- you know, these massive monolithic films coming out and series that this is a third entry and needing to perform on that level. So Well, it's a good thing that it takes a break then for 30 years. <laughs> And it's 30 years on a dot. That was 85. We jump to 2015. Now, Mad Max, not on my radar at all. Yeah. Like, the, the, just the entire world, things sure. about it. I, I just, I knew it was some of the earliest properties for Mel Gibson. Sure, sure. And, and that's really it. So this started to get chatter and talked about in 2015. People yeah. were excited for it. Then there was. There was an organic reaction to this film mm-hmm. and how crazy it was. And it led people who would never really sit down and watch a film like this. It got... Their asses in the theaters. Absolutely. You know, and it definitely had a little cultural moment, which was great. And I was one of those people who was just like, let's go see it. Let's go check it yeah, out. Yeah. And was wowed and visually Absolutely. striking. It's, it's something different. He takes 30 years off. It is George Miller once again, and he is in the writing. He's in the writing room for all of these as well. Yep, yep. Uh, we should note, it, George 
Agil Ogilvy? Ogilvy? I'm sure it was the opening. <laughs> he was attached to Thunderdome. Yeah. The only time his name pops up. Right. Um, uh, I was trying to do some research into it. He, uh, the best I can see is that he was kind of like a second unit director. Uh, but okay. Ogilvy doesn't really have much of a career to his, himself. Uh, he's okay. got like four films. So I uh, didn't really know the story about it. And unfortunately, kind of... Despise Thunderdome enough not to, not to dive too much deeper. So. Um, <laughs> all right, so nine years ago, 2015, Mad Max Fury Road, rated R again, and uh, two hours on the dot. These mm. do get progressively longer, yep, yep. which we'll definitely talk about next film. Uh, but two hours on a dot, uh, just kick it in for those who maybe aren't familiar. They're, now they're just getting into yes. Mad Max via Furiosa coming out. Yep. Um, set this film up. What is it about? And... Let's talk about it. Yeah, well, I, I'm going to come out swinging on this one here, Tom, and say that Mad Max Fury Road is pound for pound one of the best action movies to come out in the last 25 years. Uh, this is a marvel. Uh, this is a, a spectacle. Uh, yeah. And this project is a six-time Oscar winner, making 2015 one of the great years for movies. Nonetheless, the return of George Miller in such a huge, huge way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, especially with his last three films to come out in the 2000s, all being kids' movies. Yeah, I mean, he did Happy Feet, Happy Feet Two. Yeah, and then and Babe, uh, Babe, a Babe, Pig in this big, big, big city. <laughs> <laughs> Was Maybe that, got those pigs from Thunderdome. When did that come out? Was that late 90s? Or was I think that... it was like 98. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who doesn't love Happy V1 and 2? That's a cinematic masterpiece. Elijah Wood. <laughs> but it's true. He, he, he does these three. This is two Lord of the Rings references. <laughs> Stay in your lane. <laughs> But it's true, he does three little kids' movies. And, yeah, right. And comes blasting in swinging, with Fury Road. Swinging, swinging. <laughs> you know, just so rated R, too. Like, oh, yeah, like, yeah. Like, so, so grim in a lot of areas. Uh, man, uh, just an amazing production story with that. Um, you know, Miller did not plan for this gap, however, uh, with the his prized cinematic universe being top of mind for the many, many years in between. Apparently, the original concept for Fury Road was drafted actually in 1987. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. Uh, this kind of glorious return to motor madness off of the criticism of Thunderdome mm -hmm. uh, and structuring the story as one long chase sequence. That's what was kind of buzzing in his head since, 70, or since 87. Uh, but folks, never has a production rightfully earned the term development hell more than this movie right here. Uh, in an absolute shitstorm, uh, economic factors caused by 9-11 and the Iraq War saw Australian production run massively over budget. Wow. Uh, by the time Miller gets his first chance at actually filming in the early 2000s, we of course see his lead star Mel Gibson chest deep in controversy. Oh, he was in. He was involved in this. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Miller, I believe, tried to film it in two thousand, two thousand one. Uh, at, prospectively after Babe in the Big Big Wow. Big, <laughs> big now big that city. has to do with the nine eleven stuff then, because Mel Gibson yes. was still huge then. Yes. When he got he was offered Gladiator. Yes. And then did the Patriot at this time. Yep. So absolutely. then he tried again. And when was the big Mel Gibson meltdown? I don't know the exact dates. I feel of like that, that was oh eight ish. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This also lost Sigourney Weaver as uh, Charlize Theron's um, wow. role. Boy, she is just nabbing for any sci-fi fan. She is just going. <laughs> She's the queen. Man, wow. I, I like this building theory on on your end of the table. Kind of hating on Sigourney. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just all props, you know. Talk about staying in your lane. She's think, got a lane. I think you're you're dead on the money, though. She really, her agent is like, hey, there's another sci-fi <laughs> franchise? Are we a part of that? <laughs> are, we, are we on that one? So Okay, so I didn't realize, I didn't do the research on that. Uh, yeah, or could certainly crazy. go deep, deep enough. Crazy. So we tried in the early 2000s, 9-11. Well, technically, uh, uh, this, these these budget problems uh, were seated back in the 90s. First attempt filming in the 2000s, just a shit storm of, of, of circumstances, right. you know, uh, sinking it. And then even and then jumping the forward to the real production of the film, there is many, many stories of drama among the cast and just like the sheer scope of practical effects being done in this film. It yeah. just hung above like a dark cloud for a project that... Honestly, pre-hype for this film was destined to come out as a stumble. Like, sure, it might have mm -hmm. been interesting that he's returning to this, but not the critical success. Right, nothing that it was is. quite going going appropriate. Exactly. For it. What? Who was not getting along on set? Uh, Charlize and Tom Hardy. Apparently, filming in the desert was no good. Also, Tom Hardy, and I'll, I'll talk about it in a second, has gone on record that he said that he really does, he didn't th he didn't want to try in this film. He thought it was going to be a joke. 
Uh, so I didn't know that. Yeah, I thought those yeah. two would be kind of good together. Sure, sure. I think they they, they buttoned up now, but uh, yeah, yeah. All, all wow. a, a myriad of problems for this film. Right. I mean, this is really development hell. I mean, both for the thirty years in between, yeah, that you gap, know, an yeah. idea, but. Uh, just uh, George Miller had to had fight tooth and nail for this idea, and that's so. when you need that art tour. That's when you need the mm. one guy helming it who has the entire creative vision. Yes. Vision that just needs to happen. Like this yeah. reminds me much of the Revenant, mm. which yeah. was a lot of kind of two thousand fifteen. Tom yeah. Hardy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we, <laughs> we both gave a note, different notes. <laughs> Uh, but production hell. <laughs> yes. Was that 2015? Yeah, 2015. This was uh, Fear Road and The Revenant were in the same Oscars as well. Uh, also, you know, pretty okay. wow, pretty uh, pretty interesting year for the Oscars. But as so far as that go. but production hell, absolutely. Yeah. And again, you need it, it. It will be it will be hell. Yes. And coming out, it won't be good unless you have that guy who's helming it. The reason, I, you know what I mean? It's yeah. just. I think a, a great note uh, because. No one is holding a gun to Miller's head to come back to this. This is a passion project as as as, oh, as yeah. much as it goes. And also, let's not I, – I don't think we noted it in the previous reviews, but Miller's first three films are the first three Mad Max films. This wow. is his roots, you know, yeah. as far as those those uh, trademarks of, of uh, sped-up footage and the type of shots he goes for. So, folks, it gives me great joy to say that George Miller pulls it off and is no doubt the best film he has really ever made. Mm-hmm. Mad Max Fury Road is that one long chase sequence Miller dreamed up so many years ago. I could throw countless superlatives at the description of the film's intensity, but somehow calling it mad really just gets to the point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this marks a departure of Max's story being told chrono- uh, chronologically uh, and instead puts us nebulously in a another adventure in Mad Max's legend, which I really like. That was always a vibe in Road Warrior and Thunderdome, but this writing style was kind of explored to give us more of a broader taste of the wasteland, which will definitely be the template going into Furiosa and why the films are paired and, and tied together much more than just being a prequel. You know what I mean? Would yeah, you say yeah. the same? Uh, yeah, definitely. But now instead of a cowboy or gun-for-hire type character, we see Max within a few degrees of crazy as his surroundings, forcing him to be just another survivor of the wasteland. Um, I can't tell you how much I love that type of approach in this character, that the wasteland has made him strange. You know, the wasteland has made him kind of mute. Uh, to Tom mm. Hardy's maybe, you know, kind of dicey acting in this. Uh, immediately we see him captured once again, losing that iconic V8 interceptor uh, at the hands of the craziest bunch he has ever come across, the War Boys. Fanatical soldiers of Immortan Joe, uh, he owns this section of the wasteland along with multiple outposts and sub-factions all keeping this empire running this operation might just be his way out of the nightmare, however, as Max, Max hitches a ride with Furiosa to embark on an odyssey across the apocalyptic dust bowl with the war boys on their tail every step of the way. Uh, I mean, I'm just uh, in love with this movie. Yeah, I, <laughs> I mean, really do love this movie. It's really impressive. It yeah. is really impressive. Uh, I mean, I kid you not, 25 minutes into this movie, there's already more car mayhem than the last five and five Fast and Furious movies. Like, I, I would really it, love it, someone to do a count of how many car wrecks we get in that first 25 <laughs> minutes alone. It's wild. And, and and not only that, I mean, you want to talk about a small story, like I yeah. talked about with, with, uh, with two. Mm. Uh, the story is the most basic. Sure. This is a, a chase. W- is one sentence story. Now we get a little <laughs> bit development here or there, uh, which which kind of gives us a roadmap or gives us at least something to pull on for Furiosa. Yeah, you know yep. what I mean. There's enough shown to us at least. Mm-hmm. But man, uh, talk about just execution in this one simple idea that he had. Yeah, which is one long chase. Absolutely, absolutely, and it being like this tour of the wasteland, which you know I, I feel like. Uh, for as much as the gaps that Furiosa fills in the story and gives explanations to, you know, questions that I, I just seeing Fury Road yeah. didn't really need answered. No. Nope. Um, I feel like that's the brilliance of Fury Road that so much is introduced to us at a mile a minute and we're still able to not get lost in yes, the film. Because it's I mean? so simple at its core. Yeah. It, it is, and that's what I said earlier when these films are so much sitting there and being wowed or shocked by something. Yeah. 
And man, does this have it in spades? Mm-hmm. Where you, when you try to start answering questions, it's like no, 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 no. That's the <laughs> yeah. point. Yeah, that's yeah. the point. I don't want. I want. I, I want the the one movie. I want just a bunch of questions. <laughs> yeah, answer, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> and the craziness. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I would say that you know this insane opening to the film just does so much heavy lifting. Uh, you know, not once in the first quarter of the runtime do we ever slow down, and somehow. While all this madness is playing out on screen, we are being fed little nuggets of information and world building that we're able to kind of piece this story together. Uh, And it's also, let me say, it's not rocket science either. I feel like piecing the world together through this story, if anything, this, uh, you know, uh, trying to head for Oasis type of journey that they're going for, it's almost like dirt simple and and allows for the world building to step in and be like, oh no, there's, there's little, little, little enriching nuggets of, uh, of what we see with the craziness of the war boys or, or how that operation works, how the empire works. Just great. Absolutely great. The movie does a fabulous job at introducing the craziest concepts and pulling it off uh, from the war boys zealot culture to the problem solving Max has to do within the chaos uh, to crazier and crazier villains being introduced. It never lets its foot off the gas. Uh, we spoke about this at Philly Fan Expo uh, at our con panel. Does more time in the world help or hurt world building? There's definitely some wild shit thrown out in this film that might not always land or maybe would sound a bit silly once again. I don't know what the, the girlfriend reaction to the Mad Max world would be <laughs> uh, with, with characters named like Scrotus right? <laughs> and Lord Humongous. But mostly it, it, it's found in concepts that are shown briefly on screen that maybe would take away from something but are equally crazy and shocking that they help the story. Now, I strongly yeah. believe it all works because the movie is so earnest about these concepts. Uh, when you know you see Morton Joe have a a milking farm right, on right. top of a you know plateau, right. <laughs> uh, you know it just kind of works because it may not fully land with the audience, but we've probably left that scene in the dust minutes ago oh, and are on to more concepts, you know? I mean, I, I, the classic red guy strapped to the biggest machines and speakers glaring as he's playing <laughs> yeah. guitar. Yeah. I don't understand where the speech, speakers come from, how they're being powered, oh, so how true. the guitar is working. Yep. It doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> why does he have to be strung up while he's playing? And why is there a flamethrower on the guitar? Right. I, I'm all for it. <laughs> And yeah. everybody was. That's when this yeah. came out. Everyone's just like, okay, let's. Yep, we're yeah, doing it. It really was unanimous. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! But I feel like it, it, it still holds up in that way. Oh. Watching it in in you know uh, for for a modern watch now nine years. I mean, crazy to say, but nine. years I can't later. believe it's 2015. This is, and I've heard other people say the same thing. I feel uh-huh. the exact same way. If you get a new TV, new sound system, mm. this I oh I turn to this movie. In fact, the past two TV two TVs I bought. <laughs> <laughs> I throw this on. That's awesome. And I think my last speaker system or two, I throw this on. That's great. Because that's it's just it's a movie that's meant for that. Yeah. It absolutely. Is visual and audio. Yeah. Not that every movie isn't, but you know what I mean if you it, see the movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, and it's in it's even in the way that Miller produced this, uh apparently, you know, for this round that actually went into the production of the film, the yeah. entire thing, like beat for beat, was fully storyboarded, uh, fully drawn out. So uh having the the visual identity of the film be so strong. I feel like it comes through in the product yeah. as well. And then the way it looks yeah. is beautiful. Absolutely. Uh, uh, absolutely beautiful. This reminds me much of a Denny and Dune, mm-hmm. uh, Denny Villeneuve, mm-hmm. because of just... Uh, sand can look so good. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, the color of the film is just spectacular. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I would say I have only some slight gripes with the film, and I'm bringing it up simply because they come out in every time I rewatch the film. Uh, Tom Hardy is not trying very hard in this, uh, and like I said, has even gone on record about the effort he's put into the role. Uh, many moments I was just wishing for him to either... Be more heroic, be more crazy, or just put a little bit more effort into it. Um, I, like I was telling you, Tom, beforehand, uh, I might be covering uh, 2008's Bronson next week just because I was craving Get for a little like, personality. Yeah, yeah. I wanted Tom Hardy, of why we love Tom Hardy, yeah. you know, as kind of a really crazy actor. 
I, th- I think let me I'm going to disagree a little bit on this sure sure uh, again and I think it helps with I know that I've watched I've watched this film three times before watching the original Mad mm-hmm. Maxes you know this is now my fourth time watching the film mm-hmm. and this is just a different Max mm-hmm. I see Mel Gibson's Mad Max and Tom Hardy's two completely different characters along with the era and I kind of like right along with the era but I kind of like that the, no, like Tom Hardy's not trying, or he even came out and said he wasn't trying. Mm. That's okay, because the way the character was written, mm. or not written, sure. really, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a guy, I, it's, I'm okay with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, as long as he's there physically, and I think that he is, mm. I, I, I was kind of okay with it. I love how there is almost no talking in this film, mm. and I love specifically him. You have to do so much to get any type of word out of him. Yep. I'm totally okay with that. So. Yep. Hearing that he said that he wasn't even trying that much, to me, it doesn't affect the performance. Sure. Not much was asked of him. Yeah, that's a good point. You know point. what I mean? And, and, I and it certainly doesn't affect the visuals or, or how the movie flows or anything like right. that. He's along for the ride as well. Now, I can say, if I was a big fan of the original Mad Max ones first mm-hmm. and saw this, I would be upset because I'm just like, this is not this is not even close to Mel Gibson's mm-hmm. character. True. We're dealing True. with somebody completely different here. Right. And that's another way I just turn in my brain, I totally have these things separate. Yeah. You know? I, I like I like the uh, separating as the era because I mean I feel like you even feel that in the design of everything of the world. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it's just a totally different world. Uh, on the back of some of his uh, mumbling, you know, despite this <laughs> winning an Oscar for sound mixing so much of this sounds like dialogue that is ADR'd, and I've always felt this way too. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's moments that I don't know. It just in no way does it sound like these lines are coming out of the character. Right, go into ADR again. Uh, ADR would be just uh, in the post production, adding lines to it, even you know, recorded in a studio, added to the uh, right. to the track. This is done in a very sloppy way. Probably the most infamous example this year was Madam Web, where it has like an oh, entire well, like <laughs> entire, you know, the whole runtime <laughs> dedicated to, you know, redubbed lines. But these type of redubbed lines, I just feel like they were always a little sloppy for me, especially when this was winning an Oscar for for sound mixing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll give full credit to Junkie XL. Um, uh, once again, a EDM artist jumping to composer, making an amazing soundtrack, uh, probably being his best. But the rest of the sound mixing I felt was spotty, especially for spoken lines that clearly sound like post production studio editions. And okay. maybe that comes with just filming in the desert, and they just didn't have good audio. Or too impossible to, to get do it, anything, and all you know? right. The fact that the crashes and fire was real. Mm. Maybe they just needed that. It was impossible to get sound. Right, yeah. right. Uh, or or get really clear verbal audio in the mix of uh, you know all the the mayhem and the the, the car carnage right. going on. Right. So, Tom, for the second time this year, though, I need a moment to freak out about design, <laughs> and and we've kind of been doing it already. Uh, so sure. Far. Now wait, are we off? Are we going off of what you had problems with? No, 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 not at all. This oh, is, oh, this is uh, still gripes completely aside. Now those those two gripes are the the only thing. Okay. It really boils down to Hardy's performance and the sound. Can mixing. I insert gripe then? Sure, Just sure. While we're still on that train, yeah. and get off. Um, I have to say, it is the CGI is more noticeable now. Mm, now yes. the thing is, some of the CGI is almost purposeful. Yeah, it's not even trying to hide itself. Right, and for that, I'm almost okay because it's so apparent. Um, I don't know. You know, sometimes when movies are aware of what they're doing, yep. it makes it more palatable. And mm-hmm. I feel like some of the CGI used is meant for that. Yeah, yeah. Green screen is more noticeable. A big thing about this was all the practicalities, the practical mm-hmm. effects of the cars. All the mm-hmm. cars were real and could actually go. The explosions and fire was real. Yep, the tumbles, there's the flips, a, absolutely. Right. There's a lot other go there's a lot of other things going on though, on cars or in vehicles, mm-hmm. right outside of the vehicles, whatever, that needed green screen in studio work. Yep. Or green screen out in the desert. Yep. And some of that I'm starting to pick up more, especially with this last watch. Where that's why I wanted you to rewatch it too, because I was picking up on a similar thing. Like there's a the rear projected element. It looks yeah, there, a little bit more artificial. There's some age to it. Yeah. So it doesn't feel as real as mm-hmm. before. Um, I it's still I'm absolutely always going to give credit to the film for practical effects. Yeah, and where it matters in the racing sequences, sure. but but where it's there, and it's not like it was used a little bit. Mm-hmm. It's definitely there. It is starting to be a little bit more no- noticeable yeah. now. I feel like you see it a lot in when we're from a Morton Joe's kind of citadel perch. Yeah. Whenever he's looking down for some reason 
on the you know it just it's just a hard blend mm -hmm. from the set of him yeah. where he's actually physically standing and then what they're putting on the green screen basically just being the projected footage of uh you know the the masses below uh of the citadel and that, uh, that i notice it there but i do notice it in some of the chase stuff too oh really close-ups with the vehicles are often green mm. screen because when you're on the characters faces or something like that oh, or noise sure. has to happen with them yeah, yeah, yeah. or you can't just naturally be driving at high speeds with some of the stuff they have to do where tom mm -hmm. hardy is on the vehicle um it's starting to bleed through a little bit there sure i'm still gonna say the movie does there's a realness to the film and that's really appreciated yeah um a bugaboo that we're really going to talk about in next film for me mm, oh, sure sure um but it's starting to show its age a bit but anyway that's all the negative stuff yeah. we can go yeah. to praise. <laughs> well no i'm glad you brought it up because i had some notes about it but i didn't know uh, until recording today that you actually watched it right uh, yeah. so i'm glad that because if there's anyone that I wanted a sounding board uh, about where it maybe looked a little bit spotty, but just didn't like necessarily detract from the film in a huge way, it was absolutely you know talking about it with you. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, there was there was just something there that I was looking at. I was just like, man, it, it's, it's not it 2015 anymore. Yeah, is it? <laughs> it is not 2015. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, as far as design, this is it, it's a feast. Uh, you know, there, there's just so much here that uh, I, I absolutely love to death. The gang leaders are so so awesome. My favorite being by far the bullet farmer with his tank tread car. It's just like what, uh, and the fact that that comes into play on driving through like a mud uh, area of the wasteland. You know, all of the car design madness, uh, which, how do you communicate which car is a Morton Joe's? Well, I guess you put two fucking Cadillac Coupe de Ville's on right. top of one another. <laughs> that's the boss. That's the that's the lead bad guy. I mean, just amazing. I think uh, all of the hot rod shit that is taken to an extreme. I mean, if the first film was American Graffiti on Meth, this is a chemical cocktail of meth DMT and an EpiPen straight to the heart to round things out. <laughs> I, the design of the War Boys just skyrockets them to, I, I mean, just the coolest bad guys the Wasteland has to offer. Mm -hmm. um, I love their their rally cry, their symbol being the V8 cylinders yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, with yeah. their hands. Uh, I mean, just all all the aspect of the War Boys. Their love of chrome. Yeah, just like the whole Valhalla concept of like how they're like addicted, basically, yeah. to <laughs> to serving uh, to serving Joe. Uh, I mean, it's so great. Um, the engine sounds, uh, shot almost, you know, these cars are shot like they're animals or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's where I really love the sped up footage because they, you know, I feel like there's a visual language to the film that, that is, uh, is different than a normal racing film, different than oh. the carnage you would see in like a Fast and Furious or something like that. Yeah. Uh, it's a different beast. Um, I got four words. We already hinted that alone. Uh, electric guitar war chariot. Uh, we're just going to leave that there. Uh, and maybe most of all, I love how drastic the color palette is in this film. You, you said this mm -hmm. a moment ago. You know, sometimes the blue aesthetic at night can be a little bit much, but the fact that any like fire or light then provides it in full color, uh, just such cool. Just such a cool piece uh, of how to design the world. Of course, the Dust Bowl sequence being the, the the crown jewel of this entire film, where you get like just this mash of black and lightning and red and fire, and it's just man, it's just yeah. The, uh, the color is fantastic. Yeah, uh, it, it just pops. It is. It's a visual feast. It really yeah. is. The type of film that it's a film for a reason. You know, you you come across yes. a lot of stories that could be in a lot of different mediums, uh, a lot of different formats. Uh, this is a film through and through, and I feel like it just it all t ties into uh, what's going on in the visuals and the shock value in that. But, uh, folks, I, I could really go on and on about this film, but the more I do, the closer we get to the review just being a live reaction video of every second of the movie <laughs> playing out. I mean, it's just, it would be like a watch along. Bottom line, if you've seen it, you know what's up, and if you haven't seen it, I'm straight up jealous for the first time watching experience you have to look forward to you. Uh, we're going to go ahead and give Mad Max Fury Road an 84. Wow. Yep. Wow. Woo. Very big. Uh, quite a jump up from 25. It's on, like I said, it's on the site. I have not seen it on the site in forever. I was yeah. even on it a little bit and like like fixing something. Yeah. I just wasn't paying attention to it. Wow. Yeah. I yeah. forget about it. Yeah. 84, a great movie. Man, great score, a great movie. 
And, well, yeah. four times in, you need a Tommy Two this Shoes. This gets the Tommy Two yeah. Shoes. This is <laughs> yeah. two shoes and one lace okay. very easily. Excellent. Uh, very close to the cream of the top. Or yeah. the, the Cream of the crop. Cream of the crop. Cream of the crop. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, two shoes, one lace, eighty-four percent. We're, we're right there. I mean, yeah. this is just a phenomenal movie, absolutely. And for such a sim- simple reason, a, a just a, a, a WTF reason. I mean, mm, yeah, just being different. Thank yeah. you for being something different, <laughs> right? You know, right. yep. After twenty fifteen, things really start to go downhill. I think the down fall of Hollywood kind of started in 2009. Really, fifteen was a relatively good year. I had some issues with fifteen for sure. Okay, okay. Um, but uh, after this, it's when things I think really. Start to interesting, go. interesting. I, I mean, it, it's tough when you see Furiosa's performance, and for what's been kind of a growing dialogue online is that is it been there, done that? Certainly, it's all crazy. Certainly, it's all um, you know the same aesthetics uh, of of the of Fury Road. Is it not enough of a step into right. that shock, into that like you said, the WTF of yeah, it? Yeah. So. And okay, so with that, we'll go right into our producer segment because we do have a producer for today, mm. Ben. We have Michael Romano coming in. Oh, excellent. With a Space Odyssey donation. And so even in his very small note, he says, your 2001 pennies are on the way. <laughs> and yes, they are. The, here they are. And here they are. Uh, of course, 2001 pennies, Space Odyssey for 2001, a Space Odyssey donation. Seems to be everybody's favorite. And yeah, that's that's a fan favorite for sure. Uh, Michael, Nothing else written then? That's it. Oh, Mike, you got to... Tell me, tell me which of my opinions is trash. What, what, what do you want me to cover? Yeah. You know, <laughs> Mike, if you want a if you want a larger note or whatever, you know, Tom dot Vin at thedailyratings dot com. If you have something on your chest still you want to get off, feel free to feel Absolutely. free to hit us up. We'll be more than happy. PayPal the PayPal window only gets two hundred and fifty characters, mm. so you don't have to be limited to that. If you have questions, comments, critiques, whatever, Tom dot Vin at the Daily Ratings. Feel free to email us there. Uh, but Michael, thank you so much. I don't think you've donated before, so you're a new producer of the Daily mm, Ratings. Yes. We appreciate that so, so much. You have no idea. <laughs> As we're laying the value for value seeds, <laughs> it's nice to have someone actually come in this year that's a fresh face and uh, a new producer of the Daily Ratings is huge. Michael, you are the executive producer of episode 136. Uh, we thank you so, so, so much. And folks, if you want to be a producer of the Daily Ratings, you go to the donations tab. Uh, at thedailyratings.com and through your monetary support you become a producer of the Daily Ratings so um, Michael decided to donate Space Odyssey donation that's a set donation it's fun but you can kind of peg whatever number you want if you if you just want to donate 5 bucks if you want to donate 10 or 20 or 50 100 or 500 it could be whatever amount that you want uh, we say it's a value for value model so we didn't make this value we didn't make the model up and more podcasts are starting to kind of pick up on it and do it but the idea is, Vin and I, are, we're not going to deal with advertising. We're not going to deal with paywalls. We're not going to deal with tier structures on the daily ratings. It's all producer-supported. Um, so whatever you're feeling this week, are you listening to the podcast? Are you using the website? That's value in your pocket. We ask, can you give us value back in our pocket? That's why it's called the value for value model. Uh, like I said, you go to the dailyratings.com. And you head to the donations tab, and you can donate through PayPal, credit or debit card. You can even do Venmo if you want. All the links are right there for you. However you want to donate is fine, and however much or little you want to donate is fine. Everybody's got their own finances going on. We're not going to force you to kind of commit to a certain price Mm, each month, like a Patreon or something. That's not fair. Everyone's got something else that's different going on. And uh, that's why we're doing it the value for value way. So, Michael, thank you so much for being a producer. Just like when you, just like in Hollywood, when you financially support a product, you were uh, or a project, you're a producer of that thing. So, like I said, executive producer, episode one thirty six. Michael, thank you, and for all you listening, uh, become a producer today. Go, Absolutely. Go to dailyratings dot com. Head to the donations tab. And it's so much of what we talk about. Even I mean, we've covered a lot of new films this year. Yeah, I mean, we had the uh, the the eight episode slot and whatnot. Mm, yes, uh, yes, we did. If you know, if, practically speaking, is if this saved you some time, if this uh, like we heard from Isaac, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago. If this is going to help you kind of in your movie watching, what actually you're checking out or what you may be avoiding, uh, th- that's that's value in your pocket. We definitely want to uh, hear from you at very minimum and what difference it made. Yeah. So. Yeah, when you donate. So, for instance, Michael just wrote, hey, your 2001 pennies are on the way. Mm-hmm. Um, but the point of also when you donate, you can send in a donation note. And that can be questions, comments, critiques. Yep. You know, do you have feedback? 
That's important to us. You're a producer. Yeah. We're going to take that seriously. Absolutely. If you just want to ask us anything, you can also use it for that time too. So it's kind of cool. It's how we're doing it. We're laying the seeds. We can see that a lot more people are listening in different parts of the world, different parts of the country. It is awesome to see. And um, as we continue to grow, it's going to be great to see this value for value format grow as well. Like mm-hmm. I said, we didn't make up the model or anything like that. There's other big podcasts doing it and more and more are doing it mm-hmm. because uh, – I don't know. If you're a big podcast listener, like I am, uh, the advertising is getting appalling. Mm. It's getting vomitous yeah. It's in, yeah. and corporate and greedy. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. It's a lesser product. I, it feels like I'm just a pawn mm. being used to sell something. Sure. Or, or to buy something, really. Yeah, yeah. And this, it's all just basically listener-supported, essentially, Absolutely. is what it is. Yeah. On top of it, really does make sense for... Uh, what we're trying to do, we're trying to make a difference in what movies you're you're watching, and uh, and and hopefully open your horizons uh, to new movies. As yeah. Well. All right, Finn. All right. So with that, let's go into our last film of the week. This is our now in theaters, our now playing. We've got Furiosa, a Mad Max saga. Let me just start things off by saying I don't love the naming of these films. Mm. I would have liked Mad Max one, two, three, four, five, or oh, whatever, okay. or Mad Max colon thing. I, I I'll we, say this much: I don't like a, a Mad Max saga. It kind of it kind of uh, yeah, gyps Furiosa right out of the gate, you know. <laughs> but I, I guess I guess so. you maybe need that in the marketing. of I it. I think it should start with Mad Max. Oh, okay, Mad, Mad Max Furiosa. Mad Max a Furiosa saga. <laughs> That's worse. No. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just Mad Max Furiosa. Yeah, then. yeah, yeah. I'll take that. Because <laughs> I guess the one in the pipeline is Mad Max Wasteland. So, okay. but that's yeah, yeah. but that's see, it's, yeah, not a Mad you're, Max you're, saga. I, that's, uh, but you, yeah, I don't like the naming of the films at all. <laughs> Producer Sean had a great one. We could just call this Mad Max scene, which I thought that was pretty Ooh, funny. Mad Max scene, I like. That. I was not looking forward this, to this movie. Oh, ever really? Since the trailer came out. Oh, I was yeah, yeah. What about am I saying? This, I knew that. I was worried about Anna Taylor Joy. I was worried about the CGI. Yeah. I was worried about how was it going to hold a candle to 2015. But regardless. I'll pass it on to you now. Set the film up for us, and how do we like our return back to this world? Uh, well, I definitely did like this movie quite a bit. Um, not that it was without problems, uh, and equally right there with you, cautious for this one for a while. Um, uh, well, okay. uh, not because I'm not gonna I... let you forget <laughs> that you were the one hyping this the most. <laughs> I think the trailer got me. The one guy who liked the trailer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This trailer was kind of hated, but um, but I, 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 it's not because I wasn't excited for a return to Mad Max. Uh, rather, George Miller's 2022 film Three Thousand Years of Longing was something I was mm. not too big a fan of, and most of all because of its spotty visual effects, which was uncharacteristic coming off of the mind blowing practical effects used in Fury Road. This also stands as the longest Mad Max uh, by a significant margin mm-hmm. compared to the original trilogy. A meaty two hours and 28 minutes. It's a long time to be in the world of Mad Max. Yes. You know what I mean? The, yes, the, very much so. The madness uh, really, really builds up on you. Uh, once again, to reference our panel, I find myself curious of what more time in the world of a franchise does to the original vision. This has so much added to it partly because of that runtime, but also for how deeply it serves as a prequel for Fury Road. So I question, do all these gaps need to be filled? The movie, without a doubt, comes from the Rogue One school of how to do a prequel. Uh, And I don't necessarily say that as a bad thing. I think this film is more for fans fans than ever. Uh, And if anything, I think it passes my question because Fury Road could... Use some meat on the bones when it comes to details. I enjoy the fact that it doesn't have details and that we move at a mile a minute, but maybe this film is a a, a nice side piece to give the people that are not ecstatic with unpacking the Mad Max wasteland uh, with, with necessary details to piece it all together. Furiosa establishes the stakeholders of the wasteland in a crystal clear way and above all else has it where it counts Motor Mayhem. Uh, I would say Furiosa is a true epic, uh, an odyssey throughout the wasteland showing us more than ever before. George Miller's twisted vision is relentless, with the tone of the film slightly dipping into comedic tones in one direction, only to crank things up more than ever in its dark post-apocalyptic experience. I actually would like to bring this up as a a soft critique and really more so curious of your experience now that you watch this film. Mm -hmm. 
do you think it's pulled in two different directions? I felt like, for one, this was darker than ever as far as the circumstances of the, what children are put into in this world and just, like, what is shown uh, of how society works. But also, probably more comedic, maybe not as comedic as Thunderdome, but probably the most comedic it's been in the new era. What, what are your thoughts on that? I think that? that's a good take. I think it's comedic because... Well, I'll, I'll start with, I think it's the darkest because we actually have the biggest the, the biggest story here. Mm. Um, I mean, you take the previous four films, wrap them together, this is still a bigger story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, A for bigger real. arc, you know what I mean? Absolutely. And more I, subject, more more settings, absolutely. So we need to get into it. It's going to be darker than Fury Road because at the heart of it, Fury Road is just a road chase. Mm. That's it, mm-hmm. you know what mm-hmm. I mean, essentially. Um, and this is so, so much more that we need to be a little bit darker. And for that reason, I think we need to be a little bit more comedic. I guess because there's a rule in the universe that says if Chris Hemsworth is in your film, <laughs> there needs to be comedy in it. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess it's all – I think that's a good take. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's also, I mean, because of the length of the film, not something I was uh, necessarily against, uh, but I just felt like it really did kind of clash. The fact that we get – uh, some some jokes thrown in there, and don't get me wrong. Mad Max has always had a silliness to yeah. it. Oh, Again, no jokes. There's, yeah, there's yeah, characters yeah. named Lord Humongous. Yes. You know, Scrotus. <laughs> like, what the, what the <laughs> fuck? Uh, but... Uh, when it comes down to it, I feel like uh, the way it dipped into some dark topics uh, like cannibalism uh, were so dark that I was like, oh, it was almost like, whoa, this is shocking in a way that uh, almost was unexpected from a film series designed to shock. So Yeah, I, I thought it was appropriate there. I, I thought it was appropriate yeah. because I think just you need a build. You know mm, what I mean? I yeah, think yeah. you need a build in the crazy and visual build. So. I wasn't reeling at any moment. Okay. I say I was really more from the comedy than mm. anything because, as you said, th- th- there is a funny tone to all of these. Yep. But a lot of the funniness comes from the ridiculous that we're seeing on screen, yep. not so much from the actual joke telling mm. on screen. A-, a great distinction, absolutely. You know what I mean? And there yep. is a huge difference there. Yep. Uh, and this has both kind of actual jokes being told and then, you the, know, that wow factor. Jokes the hilarious visibly. wow factor. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, absolutely. So, yeah, it, two different directions, and I, it, it's. I want to keep on going because okay. I, I, <laughs> I'm feeling that you don't like this one at all. <laughs> I, I'm scared. Um, I did like this movie, so I'm I'm curious. Yeah, yeah I, I like the movie as well. Uh-huh. I didn't love the movie. Okay, man, coming off of just Fury Road, mm-hmm. it wasn't quite what I was hoping or expecting. Mm, sure, uh, it's one thing to hope for it. I would just assume that some things were going to be baked in, mm. meaning, well, he would. Hey, you got to do this. You got to give us this. You got to build on this. And sure. I kind of felt like he went. It's just too long. Yeah. <laughs> and it, What did I tell you? You really, were like, you want to go see it again? I was like, I don't know if I need to see it again. <laughs> that's the only time we talked about it. <laughs> yeah. Like, you have no idea my thoughts about it other than yep. that. And I agree completely. To the, to the fact of, I would I would have really, really, really liked this movie more and Borderline loved the film mm. if it was probably a half an hour shorter. Mm. If it was long as Fury Road. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That drawn outness, it just... Does it, something it to it. It sapped it. Yep. It sapped it of... The awesomeness mm. that it could have been. Sure. Fury Road is amazing because we're just on the move. Wow. Like, wow is happening. And like you said, when we see something crazy on screen, yeah, we're probably minutes away from it already. Yeah. We, we can't even quite even comprehend what everything is. Yep, yep. And here it's so fleshed out. Mm-hmm. Um, so detail-driven. Yes. It, it absolutely hurts the film. Yeah. And uh, it, it takes what's beautiful about the simplicity of Fury Road and the non-talking. Mm. And we are talking up a storm. Chris Hemsworth, it's a chatty Cathy. <laughs> and it's like, yo, this is Mad Max. This is Mad Max. <laughs> yeah. What are, we, what, are we, what are you doing chatting up? A, 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 no, no. Right, right. I mean, pages and pages of he's dialogue like a, this guy has. Yeah, he's like a carnival barker. Like he has a, you know, his a little, little like uh, assistant acting right. it out for <laughs> any any wastelander who doesn't speak English. And in the film that I expected excess, I mm. think I was getting excess in the wrong areas. Interesting. I, I, I think that is completely valid because... Uh, because uh, I, I, I think what it boils down to me is that I enjoy all the style. It's more style than ever, mm-hmm. uh, but it almost becomes too much. Uh, and again, where it kind of scratches this question of, is more time answering questions that didn't ever need to be answered? You right. Know? The problem is you get used to it. Mm, You're sure. in the world it so knows. long that you start to get used to it, wow. and it loses that factor. I, I think that's right on the money. You know, yeah. I can't tell you how much... This two hour and twenty eight minute 
really hurt this film. Yeah, yeah. Um, which I know you agree, but regardless, that's my overall take. I took sure. kind of ran with it. Sure, no, no, no. I, I, I with the tone, the 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 actual experience of it. That that's exactly what I wanted to hear because I think it does it does make a difference. Uh, Story wise, we do see Furiosa's life play out across many many chapters, uh, with the madness of the wasteland progressing alongside her. Uh, when you're watching this, it kind of feels like five mini movies. Uh, my original note here, wondering how great a Mad Max prestige TV show might be. But without a doubt, I think the best thing to come out of cramming all of this into one story is the breathing room every character and set piece gets to develop. Uh, I like that we feel a progression in the world, whether it's the tech, whether it's the madness, or whether it's the character mm-hmm, arcs. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. I feel like that is one benefit. And if anything, like I said with my note, it had me saying, what would a Mad Max TV show do with this much time in the wasteland? And what kind of storylines would they get out? I feel like this is a very close taste to that. As close as, as you can get without being a TV show. Would you have preferred a TV show? I, that I don't know. Um, I really don't. Mostly because I probably wouldn't watch it if it was a TV show. <laughs> <laughs> I don't got the time. But uh, it, I, I feel like it's a, an interesting thought process, especially going into... Uh, I think pre-production on Mad Max Wasteland, yeah. uh, the new one. Is that so, right? That quick? I, I think so. I, because you know, I hate to say it, but Miller is getting very old. So I think it's eighty-three. No, yeah. uh, no, I think he's eighty-seven. He's eighty-seven. I think so. Holy I think, shit! I, 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 that oh, you know one. who's eighty-three? Miyazaki, who's also <laughs> who's working on his next. <laughs> You're film, right, by the way. right. Yeah, the, the hypocrite. <laughs> uh, as much as I love Miyazaki, but uh, he's his own marketing machine uh, when it comes to his projects. Uh, on a big positive note, I think this um, this this long seventy nine by the way oh seventy nine yeah, okay, he's okay. still all right all right all right <laughs> no he's he's all right <laughs> this is seventy nine uh, on a big positive note I think um, this breathing room this runway the film has is interwoven flawlessly to the point that earlier moments in the story feel like Road Warrior era kind of tech and madness in a really good way I personally loved that Hmm. Uh, i think i in general i love the earlier parts of this film the most like chapter one and two uh is where i i was like whoa this is this is coming out swinging you know each of the five chapters does a great job at illustrating why the insanity is progressing in the world uh, why it's ramping up and miller's design of the world never lets up either proving his vision of this genre stands above everyone else, or at least side-by-side side with the greats of post-apocalyptia. I mean, we've, we've thrown a lot of praise at George Miller this episode. Uh, maybe maybe not so much when it comes to Thunderdome. <laughs> <laughs> we can blame it on the other guy, though. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> blame it on Ogilvy. Uh, but, um, you know, I really do think it's uh, hats off to a guy that is this far into his career, and he's still making significant stamps on the genre right. he He's arguably created, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, I feel like that is a, a rare occurrence, uh, and to have the new era be the better era, pound for pound, yeah. is, is unheard of, frankly. I, and I, honestly, it's like he hasn't lost his... Um he hasn't lost the little kid in him yeah. at all. Yeah, just yeah. like S- Spielberg can't leave the little kid in him <laughs> for in a different way. Yeah. George Miller just seems like he's just a kid still playing with toy cars and Tonka trucks. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Wouldn't it be cool to have spikes on this one? <laughs> you know? I, yeah. I love that. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it totally comes through. Absolutely. I would say my biggest praise goes to cinematography. The camera work is wild here. Uh, I am frankly blown away with how dynamic this felt. Uh, The gliding swing of the camera is very stylized. I felt this was somewhere in the realm of like a Sam Raimi movie, not afraid to break a rule or two for the experience Mm. uh, and the experience above all else. I'd also call it somewhere a mix of anime and Sin City, uh, which is in part due to a lot more visual effects used in the film, but a very fun watch. Um, I feel like... This may have been lacking the breakneck pacing of Fury Road, but yeah. and how the actual visual sequences, how the actual action sequences are portrayed, the camera's going nuts in this film, and I feel like it was very entertaining for that reason. 
I believe, by the way, I think this is the first time that these two were working together. I think uh, he might have kept. Yeah, I think he kept the same cinematographer throughout the old ones. Okay, wanted to get the original guy, mm. um, but he was kind of retired or sure. didn't want to didn't want to dedicate that much time to the project. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. Was, and yeah, a lot of these talents related to the original trilogy, they're kind of dying off. That was the same thing with. Uh, the guy that played uh, a Morton Joe. Yeah. Uh, Hughes. A lot of the guys still around, but yeah. yeah. Uh, like I said, I think he's just retired, basically. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, they're getting older. Yeah, yeah. Let me tell you, it was so exciting to see that after five movies this week, stretching 45 years of Miller's directing c- career, that this film had arguably some of the most youthful, unique, and punk rock energy in how it was made. Like, I really like how action sequences are shot in this, and it's all connected to the camera work specifically. Mm. This may not be up there, and certainly, unfortunately, not holding a candle to Fury Road, but this is absolutely my front runner for best cinematography this year. Uh, And in fact, you get to watch uh, a crazy action movie is just sugar on top of it. I felt it was just so dynamic and not really playing by any rules with it. You, you disagree. Well, <laughs> just because there was this really small movie called Dune that came out earlier I, in the year. Sure, I like it. I, You know I like Dune. <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm right there with you, but uh, I really do think, uh, as far as the camera work specifically, there's some magic going on here with it. Uh, even wow. with some of these shoddier digital visual effects. Well, I was going to say, I mean, it, I don't know. They look. The camera work to me looks mm-hmm. just everything about it. The film looks more artificial. Sure, sure. So much in this movie to me feels fake, mm. and it's almost I don't know what it was. I didn't do deep research into how it was filmed or the cinematography behind it. Mm-hmm. For instance, when I look at The Hobbit with with mm. when they came back with The Hobbit and they were at sixty frames a minute, yep, uh, or sixty frames per second. And using red cameras, mm-hmm. it had a fakeness to everything, even though some of the stuff was real. Yeah, you, that was you shot. smelled it almost immediately. <clears throat> on With the film. this, the entire film, where I'm getting nuggets of it in Fury Road, mm-hmm. the entire film felt fake to mm-hmm. me. It felt like these green screens that you were spotting in Fury green Road. Green screens are just like ultra polished to the to even the real stuff looking fake, mm-hmm. or had too much of a glossiness to it, or something like that. That like, it takes away from even it. the camera movements. I I don't know. It just everything felt so artificial to me. Mm. The movie looked amazing, and I don't. I yeah. don't want that to be dropped. I don't want it, this movie. It's not like it looked like shit. It didn't sure. look like uh, I don't know, like the Batman vs Superman uh, level sure, sure, yeah. video game looking right. stuff. Right. Uh, it just didn't have this realism grit to it that mm. I thought Fury Road did. So I'm surprised with the swinging angles and things like that. I don't know. I'm I'm glad to hear that you really enjoyed it. Mm. And it's not that I didn't. I just I couldn't get on board as much. I'll definitely meet you in the middle though because. It, it does, if anything, highlight the suspicious lacking of what were so amazing uh, practical effects in Fury Road. Right. You're kind of expecting that going into this, no less it being a prequel. Right, right. And if anything, these very flourished camera movements that are swinging, you know, possibly 270 degrees around a character, hanging shots, you know, right. wild, wild cinematography, it, if anything, it spotlights the visual elements more. Uh, in a way that I don't think Fury Road even had to compare it with. Yeah, know? like I said about the close-ups, and when we're dealing, there's a lot of character stuff going on in this film. Mm-hmm. So it's a lot of close-ups at speed. That's all studio stuff. Yeah. Based, essentially, I don't want to speak in, because they did do real-world practical stuff. And, yeah, and, green, and a fair and, amount and of And green screen or blue screens in real, in, in real yep. deserts and things like that. Yep. Um, People but, complain about the deserts on this set. As highly, well. <laughs> pro- highly produced, highly produced yeah. in a way that it just wasn't sitting the best with me. Sure, sure. Um, I, you can't. It's George Miller. It's Mad Max. You can't, you know, I'm not going to say it wasn't a visual feast. Mm, mm. It was. Yeah. Uh, but I would take Dune ten times before I take this. As far as like uh, best of the year for camera work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. When okay. it comes to cinematography, as sure, well. sure. Absolutely. Well, I guess we will uh, we'll see if there's any other competitors. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, it's kind of a it's it's like where I, I said with the soundtrack with Challengers, you know, uh, there's there's plenty a year left to see uh, <laughs> competitors with it. But uh, I like plugging the Tom Dailies. So. <laughs> uh, allow me to say, uh, please, 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 please see this with good sound. Um, I really don't have too many established notes with this, but. Uh, and, and if anything, in comparison to the two, Tom, you are the more audiophile uh, of the both of us. Yeah. Really, all of the vehicle work is great, but the Thunder Bike in Chapter 1 is next level. Um, I think why I love this so much is that this Thunder Bike 
uh, match the experience uh, that the characters were having, and it kind of matched into the theater experience. Uh, in the story, this Thunder Bike, like Mad Max's V8 Interceptor, is like a legendary car of the Wasteland. It mm-hmm. has a legend to itself. And the sound of its engine beating off of the dunes creates fear in the characters. More so than any other engine in this movie about cars, <laughs> the Thunder Bike was just like booming in the Dolby Theater. I, I can't tell you how much like this made me say, oh, this is a theater experience and why it's so oh. disappointing to hear that it's, you know, a disappointment in the box office, you know? It is. I mean, the yeah. sound, it is such, it's an audio feast, yeah. this film. And I saw it in Dolby as well. Yeah. And it's funny, we have that fake IMAX kind of, and we never go in. <laughs> yeah, just, oh, it yeah. sounds great in that. I like the seats better. Yeah, the seat. uh, yeah, it's great. <laughs> but if you do have a fake IMAX or a real IMAX, a Dolby Cinema near you, go see it. If you're going to see it in that horrible movie tavern, um, <laughs> make sure you see it in their uh, one upscale theater that they have per one. <laughs> the, these engines might drown out people chewing in your ear. You, know, <laughs> or... <laughs> um, you want to be swarmed with the sound of this film. You yeah. want to go. You want to feel the bass in your seat. Mm-hmm. Um, absolutely, it yeah. really is an experience i mean we got to get people back people got to go to the film to the <laughs> theaters more it is an experience it really really is yeah i understand if you want to just wait to see it when it comes on streaming sure. i understand the attitude but going to the theater used to be a fun weekend thing if you're not doing something or you want something to do in the weekend you really ought to go see this go see it in a good in a, yeah. in a good sounding theater absolutely it rewards you yeah and maybe that's something that we can comment on a little bit more or i you know i can primarily comment on 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 my reviews that is this something that yeah it's good it still has the same rating but maybe something you could wait for specifically outside of theaters i don't know uh, maybe that's something we can incorporate but i think we talk about it a lot and yeah. sometimes if i get a feeling I'll I'll ask and stuff. You sure, know. sure. Uh, but as a significant praise, this film specifically, Furiosa, is a theater watch because, again, I feel like there was follow through in sound design that I mean, I, again, I, I just I was I was in love you gotta with immer- how these these engines sound. Yeah, you want to be immersed. Yeah, I mean, half the, half the point is the sound. Yeah, and the rawness of it, and yeah, the harshness on yeah, absolutely. Well, talk on characters. I I'm, I have a feeling I'm not going to be have many as many notes as you on these characters. I, no, I pretty much I said uh, my piece. You said your for piece? the most part. Okay. You can run with it. Okay. Um, Anatole Taylor Joy uh, was stunning. Like obviously dropped at gorgeous in this, but. I feel like really badass too in a way that I wasn't really missing Charlize too much. There's been a lot of dialogue online that part of the mm, cocktail of why this isn't doing so well is that Anna Taylor Joy does not have star power like mm. Charlize has. I don't know if that's really a factor. I don't know. What are your thoughts? There? I don't think it's a factor when it comes to a Mad Max film. Yeah, I feel like it's people grasping at straws. At I was that point. concerned about seeing her. Oh, really? I thought she has too much of a thinness mm. and those alien kind of alien <laughs> eyes she's <laughs> got on her very slender face. Gorgeous. Yeah, sure, she's gorgeous. But <laughs> you have a weird. Yeah, you love the the weird eye, like the Emma, Emma Stone. <laughs> um, is that my type? The, the, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I was, I was her just overall physique. This is why I get nervous about Zendaya in some roles. Oh, okay. because they're just like physically smaller. Oh, true. True. Um, w- it was something that you brought up with Dune too. Actually, the actual the physicality of a war uh, kind of being a, a not right. Match. Exactly. Uh, I thought she did a great job. Mm. I did. Yeah. 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 And she has a stronger voice than I thought. Yeah. Which helps. Absolutely. And I give a shout out to honestly. Uh, the kid act the kid acting way more of young Furiosa than I was expecting yeah didn't hate it yeah yeah she is uh, I guess gonna be in uh, that actress I don't know her name but uh, very young Uh, she's gonna be in the new Sonic 3 uh, <laughs> but but I mean you know it's a good property so uh, no but I, I agree way more than expected and in a good way not a not a bad kid performance like we see in Thunderdome right you know, right, where right it's like this Lost Boys Peter Pan adopted father <laughs> garbage uh, <laughs> uh, if anything I would say my praise towards uh, her role is that she plays the Mad Max insert pretty well in that it's leaning on a lot of nonverbal acting yeah yeah um, uh, you know, for the first time, we really get to explore how young minds develop in the wasteland. And again, this film having plenty of runway to do so, uh, I felt like it was an interesting aspect of kind of uh, the old argument of nature versus nurture. Well, the nurture happens to be crazed psychopaths. So I felt that was a, an interesting element of the, of the character. Against all odds, uh, Chris Hemsworth wasn't terrible. <laughs> I think even with his role-leaning comedic, uh, I did think, once again, 
I liked seeing him as a failed villain in five chapters. You know, mm. I felt like mm-hmm. there was a. Uh, you know, was I in love with this character? Is uh, Doctor Dementis? Yeah. Uh, you know, in the long list of crazy names, you know, was this a an all time character role for him? No, but I did enjoy with how much time we were spending with him. We really had a, a more significant arc than probably any villain Mad Max has had to go up. You know, Mad Max has had in its rose. Oh rose yeah, gallery. definitely. Definitely. So. I think the main point of both of the characters uh, directing, uh, you know, directly benefiting from this breathing room I mentioned, uh, seeing them progress, seeing them change with the world around them, I would say it was easily worth the time I spent with the film, even though the whole film experience is slightly dulled by the longer it runs yeah. on. Uh, it's a little bit pulled in both directions, kind of like the tone that we commented on before. Overall, I would say... I have some very minor notes on what took away from the experience, but honestly, nothing too major. It really comes down to being this big-ass Mad Max film and feeling that I don't really need to see it again. Uh, This is a quality that I don't think we've touched on too much with the podcast, that uh, it's, it's good. I liked it a lot. I liked the time I spent with it. It is a little bit too long, though. And for that reason, That's why. I don't know if it's a, a rewatchability I, to it. I kind of have the same feeling towards yeah. it. Where it's Fe- like Fury Road's the that. opposite. Right, I mean, right. Fury Road really is the opposite, and I feel the same way. And, and I don't know if that's a great – I've said it a couple times recently in mm-hmm. recent weeks of uh, – I like to, I, I've, I don't feel like I need to see it again, or I would like to see this mm, again. Yeah, yeah. It's just been on my mind a little bit more. I don't know if that's generally a great note for people. I don't know sure. if that's appreciated or not appreciated or mm-hmm. whatever. But, man, it is a feeling. Yeah. And stepping away from this, the length hurt it so much where Mm -hmm. it's like, I'm glad to have this time back in the Mad Max world. Yeah. Glad to see an an expanded story of another character. Mm -hmm. I actually am okay with that. Yeah. And have it not revolve around Max. But Mm -hmm. it it does ask a lot of you to stick around for that long. Absolutely. And I think, I I don't know, it's tough because like maybe like some some of our ideas for like stickers on the site, like uh, So Bad It's Good and and other aspects, even the Tommy Two Shoes, I don't think rewatchability is necessarily something that should be in the score calculation no, uh, and the worthiness. So. But it is something that I feel like that is a an opportunity for the podcast as a product for the daily ratings to enrich what is just a score on a billboard. Right. You know yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah. If you're looking on the site, you know, I feel like there's something more that we can add value with uh, with talking through it. Um, I also think I could be a lot harsher on some of that pacing, uh, you know, if anything, leaning right along your side, Tom. Uh, but I also, there, there's a degree there that I feel like compared to Fury Road, a- any movie is kind of a slog, you know, so I, this movie kind of shot itself in the foot uh, by having to follow up and, uh, again, being this Rogue One-style prequel where every gap, every question is answered, uh, every gap is filled, uh, not to mention the, the runway in the film being kind of what works, or at least my praise with characters. Uh, that's not something that should keep you away from seeing this film. Uh, and that goes double for seeing it in the theater because I do think for that first watch, even if you're not going to watch it again, it was a hell of an experience. And compared to a lot of the trash side of the movies we've seen this year, uh, this is one of the gems, even though we might have you know some problems with it uh, or it may not hold up to its elder Fury Road. With that said, we're going to go ahead and give Furiosa a 78. Wow, 78. That is, that is a strong score. Yeah. We do have some new listeners. I'll say again, for us, you know, this isn't Rotten Tomatoes, mm. um, where the high 80s and high 90s are given out all the time. A 78 for us is a very good movie, because yep. 80% is some of the best you're going to get all year, mm-hmm. if you're in the 80%. Um, it's it's difficult to get in the 80s. It's almost impossible to get in the 90s, just so you know where we're coming from. Sure, so 78 sure. is literally just a very good film uh, for the daily ratings. Well I, worth I, your I, time and well worth the theater experience. Yeah, as well. and I appreciate this. Like, I'm not mad at you for this score. I would mm. probably rate it a little bit less. I don't have a Tommy Two Shoes for oh, it. Oh, really? I am, I'm, yeah, I'm glad I saw it. It's, it's cool if you disagree with me on this. I'm glad I saw it. It's just the length hurt it in so many aspects. Mm. Um, I liked Chris Hemsworth. 
for 20 minutes. And then <laughs> yeah. another two hours and eight minutes happened. And it was too much Chris Hemsworth. Yeah, It yeah. was too much. Do you uh, think he should have maybe disappeared for a couple of the chapters? Should have disappeared for longer. Mm. He should have talked. Come back for the last. He should have talked so much less. <laughs> The, what I, it's just an element that I love about Fury Road. Sure. And man, is this filled with dialogue. Pages of dialogue. Yeah. Pages yeah, of yeah. pages he had to read through and memorize sure. for this film. And it is too much. It's too much. And there's, the problem is there's scenes that could be cut or definitely scenes that could be condensed mm. that would make it a snappier, more Mad Max feeling film. Sure. For that reason, it's just – it is hurt. And I understand – you know, you're shooting yourself in the foot after coming off of Fury Road. That is I, just I think go, that's go, a real go. factor, you know, the expectation. Yes, but, I'm, but the problem is I'm not sitting here going like, well, I wouldn't know what to cut if we had to. It's oh, There's things true. I would chop off, and I was noticing it while watching. Mm, true. Saying, we don't need to see it this long. It doesn't need to drag out like this. Yep. Regardless, a very good movie, and I'm so happy I saw it in theaters. Mm, and I, yes. knew I, I knew I wanted to see it in theaters. You know, walked out of there saying that was too long, but you're in the Mad Max world. Yeah, you know? and post Absolutely. post two thousand, you're going to be treated. Yeah, that's what that means. That's Absolutely. what we've learned. Absolutely, it's certainly not a PG thirteen mess, <laughs> 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 especially with the kid actor and whatnot. You know, this really doesn't hold any punches when it comes to how dark this uh, this world can be. Right, so. right. Well, uh, excellent, Vin. I, I mean, that's all you need right there. We just went through everything. <laughs> we went through everything. <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, secondary to this, there's a comic book series uh, and a video uh, game. And But other than that, I mean, this is, uh, you know, Miller is kind of, you know, push those aside, right, especially right. for what he wants to do with Wasteland coming. Have so. you played the video game? No, no. I hear it's like a Batman Arkham style, uh, but... Uh, but honestly, uh, more than anything, uh, I feel like seeing Furiosa really set in stone that's just like Miller is the creative force. Uh, yeah. I really wonder – it made me think just in the same way that with the original trilogy, I was thinking about Lucas. I was thinking about Spielberg as far as like big franchises in the 80s. It just made me wonder of like uh, – would we have similar praise given more runway to Lucas doing the sequel trilogy or – I don't know, Spielberg staying right, with Dial right. of Destiny or anything like that. It, 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 was, it was in both directions that I was thinking, and, and that's the type of movie week that I like, uh, that I know I like this already. It, there was a lot of that was already scored, but I was finding something enriching returning to this franchise, and hopefully, folks at home, you can find the same. I love it. I know I had a good time going. I'm glad I watched all four movies, well, the four movies <laughs> yeah, this week. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Intended for. Um, I was really happy I watched. Yeah. Really happy I watched. So it was great sitting down. Vint, thank you so much much uh for watching all these the notes were great uh, it was fun to go back and forth with you anything looking forward for next week roll credits uh, a little little of a, of a dark period but one less hitchcock slot i definitely made the decision that we'll we'll stick with Hitch- hitchcock for one more uh and i actually don't know what we're gonna watch though <laughs> that's just fine and good and then we'll pick it up for next may it, it, that's good yep um and i'll watch along as well i'm excited for that all right folks thank you uh so much let's just run things down one more time we have mad max with a 68 percent mad max 2 the the road warrior with a 73 mad max beyond thunderdome with a 25 mad max fury road with an 84 and finally furiosa a mad max saga with a 78 percent some good films this week So, folks, as always, we will see you next week. And thank you so much for listening to the Daily Ratings Podcast. Hey, if you enjoyed the podcast, if you would, give us a good rating or get the word out and tell a friend about us. And just a reminder that the Daily Ratings is completely producer-supported. We want to stay away from advertising, and we don't want to have any paywalls or tier structures or subscriptions. It's all just value for value. So, are you finding value in any of the things that we're doing here at The Daily Ratings? Then become a producer and donate whatever amount of value that is. Just go to the Donations tab on thedailyratings.com, and while you're there, be sure to check out the massive amount of films that Vince has rated. So, thanks so much, everybody. We'll see you next time on The Daily Ratings Podcast. 